So hey guys, how are you all? Welcome to the fanfic club. So we are back with a brand new movie on what if Naruto unleashed as the dark Sith of Earthland. But before we start, be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Now let's begin the story. Two figures walked into the rather large penthouse, both wearing black cloaks. The first was a tall, thin humanoid, known as the species Mun, that stood at 6 feet 0 inches with no hair, pale skin, and sick yellow eyes. The second was a tall man standing at 5 feet 10 inches with gray hair, slightly pale skin, and heterochromatic eyes, his left being a blend between a sick yellow and a dark blue, and his right being purely dark blue. I must admit, my apprentice, your plan is going off quite well, the Mun stated. All thanks to your help, Master Plagueis, the man said, causing the Mun to frown slightly. How many times have I told you, we are now equals? If you were to address me with any type of formality, call me Darth Plagueis, the Mun, now identifies as Darth Plagueis, said. Of course, forgive my lack of formality, the man said. There is nothing to be in need of forgiveness, Darth Sidious. Plagueis replied. Well, enough of all this formal political stuff. The man, now identified as Darth Sidious, stated, grabbing a large wine bottle and opening it, pouring the red liquid into two wine glasses and handing one to Plagueis. Both Sith raised their glasses up. To a successful campaign. To the end of the rule of two. Plagueis said, both downing their glasses contents. While Sidious sipped on his wine, Plagueis had already gone through his glass. Here, have another glass, Plagueis. Sidious said, pouring Plagueis another glass of wine as he sat down. Oh, I really shouldn't. Plagueis said, pushing the glass away. We're going to be co-chancellors of the Republic. Tomorrow, we will become such. But for tonight, let's live a little and get hammered. Sidious said, a grin on his face as he downed his first glass, Plagueis downing his second glass. As the night continued on, Sidious plied Plagueis with more and more wine. Eventually getting to the point that the Mun couldn't even stand up properly. And finally, Plagueis had fallen asleep in a drunken stupor. Sidious began to sweat as he approached the unconscious form of his master. His heart began racing, his stomach in knots. This is it. He thought. There won't be another opportunity to kill him. Lightning with a purple hue began to cackle around Sidious's hands as he raised them, aimed at the mun he called his master. Sorry, Darth Plagueis, but the rule of two shall continue on. Dot dot quote, Sidious said to the unconscious Plagueis, a sick evil grin spreading across his face as lightning arched from his hands to Plagueis, said mun's body beginning to spasm in agony. Sidious continued to strike Plagueis with force lightning, the unconscious Mun writhing in pain. This process continued for hours upon hours. And by the time the sun rose, Sidious decided to approach the now unmoving form that was Darth Plagueis, placing his index and middle fingers to the side of the Mun's neck. There was no pulse. Sidious then felt a shift in the force of monumental proportions. It appears the dark side has chosen me as its sole agent. Sidious thought, his grin growing even wider as his eyes completely turned a dark blue and flashing their true sick yellow color. Morning had come, and Senator Palpatine had been elected Supreme Chancellor. Still, Sidious could not help but feel a sense that Plagueis was not dead. And he was right. Somewhere in Sector D13, unknown region, Plagueis felt numb, his entire being felt numb. Am, am I, dead, he thought, searching out through the force to find himself only for his non-existent eyes to widen in shock and surprise. By the force, Plagueis mentally exclaimed, he had finally done it. By discarding his physical body, Plagueis had become one with the force. Immortal. But what use is it to be immortal, and have no purpose? Plagueis mentally questioned, an empty feeling growing inside him. Perhaps, I shall find another apprentice. Plagueis said to himself, yes, I shall search far and wide for a new apprentice, one with far more potential than Sidious. But who? Eight years later, Rosemary Village. Come on, slow down, Naruto, a childish female voice exclaimed. You're gonna have to catch me first, a young boy exclaimed. The young boy stood at three feet seven inches with spiky black hair, bright royal purple eyes and slightly tanned skin. Three whisker-like marks were on each cheek and the blog-haired boy wore a plain white t-shirt and orange shorts. 
This boy was Naruto Namikaze, son of the retired red hot blooded habanero of Mermaid Heel, Kashina Uzumaki, and the yellow flash of Fairy Tail, Minato Namikaze. The owner of the childish female voice was a scarlet haired girl around the same age as the boy, standing at 3 feet 5 inches with light skin, chocolate brown eyes, and wore a white dress. This girl was Urza Scarlet, Naruto's close friend for over four years. Aha, I caught you, Naruto. Urza yelled, grabbing hold of Naruto's blonde hair so that he wouldn't run. What do I get for catching you? Hum, Naruto mumbled, thinking about an answer to the question. Suddenly, he snapped his fingers. I know, you get three wishes. Like a genie, PSSH, lame, Urza said, turning her head, which in turn caused the young Naruto to face foe. Okay, okay, how about, four wishes, Naruto offered causing Urza to grin. All right, you got yourself a deal. Urza said, I wish. Naruto, Urza, an angry Kashina yelled, causing the entire forest to shake slightly. I wish for you to get us away from your scary mom. Urza exclaimed, both herself and Naruto beginning to panic. W wish granted. Run. Naruto exclaimed, both kids running as if their lives depended on it, which to an extent it did. Stomping into the clearing the duo was in moments ago, was a fiery red-haired woman that stood at 5 feet 5 inches with fair skin, a slender, but feminine build, and violet eyes. She wore a high-collared, sleeveless blouse under a long, loose-fitting dress, and a wristband that was dark blue on her left wrist. This woman was Kashina Uzumaki, the mother of Naruto, whose grace and diction were unmatched by any other. Get back here so I can give you each a giant can of whoopus. Kashina exclaimed, running off in the direction of Naruto and Urza, only to trip on nothing. Arg, who tripped me? You tripped on yourself again, mom. Naruto called out from the forest before panicking. Crap, where do we go now? Naruto, Urza, this way, a new voice exclaimed in a hushed tone. Popping out from behind a team was another girl around the same age as Naruto and Urza. She stood at 3 feet 6 inches had long straight dark purple hair, hazel eyes, and light skin. She wore a plain white collared t-shirt and black shorts. This girl was Kagura Mikazuchi. Kagura, thank Kami you found us before my mom did. Naruto exclaimed in a hushed whisper. Quick, we don't have much time. Go go go, Kagura said, motioning for Naruto and Urza to follow her, to which they did. Kashina arrived on their location moments after they had left her fiery red hair splintering off into nine parts as they seemed to defy gravity itself. She closed her eyes, letting her maternal senses kick in. Seconds later, she opened her eyes, her once violet eyes being replaced by glowing yellow irises and sclera. Target acquired. Naruto Namikaze. Punishment level. Can of Whoopus. Kashina said mechanically, running off in the direction of Naruto, Urza, and Kagura. Kagura's house. Naruto. Urza, and Kagura rushed into the house and quickly slammed the door shut. Simon Ni, I'm home. Kagura exclaimed. A young boy a little bit older than Naruto, Urza, and Kagura came into the room. He stood at 4 feet 2 inches with brown hair, tan skin, and black eyes. He wore a light blue sweater vest on top of a white long-sleeved shirt and black pants. This boy was Simon Mikazuchi. Kagura Imo Udo, Naruto San, Urza San, what a pleasant surprise. Simon said, a smile on his face. No time to talk, hide, quickly, Naruto exclaimed. Naruto's mom is pissed off, Urza explained, causing Simon to freeze up. You gotta hide us, Simon Ni. Kagura begged. Simon looked around, as if Kashina would appear at any moment. Okay, quick, this way, Simon said, motioning to the other room. The moment he turned around, he felt it an ominous near-omniscient presence that screamed doom and despair for all in its wake. Naruto, Kagura, and Urza quickly hid behind Simon, somehow conforming so that they were not visible. Oh, H hi am Ms. Namikaze. W what are you d doing here? Simon stuttered out in fear. Oh nothing really, Simon Chan. Just looking for my son, Urza, and your little sister. Kashina said in an overly cheerful tone that stilled fear in all who were on the receiving end. W what for? Simon asked, so I can open up a can of lupus. 
Kashina replied. Somehow, in Simon's eyes, she began to grow until she was towering over him, her entire body turning pitch black with yellow glowing lights where her eyes were, and her fiery red hair had begun to glow as it split into nine parts. You wouldn't happen to know where they would be, do you? She asked. T there right behind me. Please don't open up a can of whoopus on me. Simon exclaimed. Traitor. Naruto exclaimed, all three kids running out from behind Simon to the door, only to be caught by Kashina's hair tendrils. Good boy, Simon, Kashina said, patting the frightened boy on the head before turning to Naruto, Urza, and Kagura. She cackled as she carried the trio out, hanging them by the scuffs of their shirts and cracking her knuckles. Now to punish you three. One can of whoopus later. Naruto, Kagura, and Urza each held their heads as they let out a groan all three sporting a large comical bump on their heads. O-W-W, -W, all three exclaimed, that'll teach ya to try and pull a prank on the master. Kashina said, a hint of smugness in her voice as she spoke. But Moom, how will I ever learn to open up a can of whoopus if you won't let me? Naruto complained, the same way I did when I was your age, by increasing your badassery. Kashina exclaimed, now, say goodbye to your friends, Naruto. Lunch is going to be ready soon. Can Kagura and Urza stay for lunch, mom? Naruto asked. I'm not so sure, Kashina said, only to be assaulted by the dreaded triple puppy dog eyes, courtesy of Naruto, Urza, and Kagura. Please, Naruto, Kagura, and Urza asked. Quote dot dot dot, all right, all right, fine, Urza and Kagura can stay for lunch, Kashina said, just please, for the love of Kami. Stop the puppy eyes. Thanks mom per mega second namikaze. Naruto Kagura Urza exclaimed. I hope you too like miso ramen. Kashina exclaimed. Yay, Naruto, Kagura, and Urza exclaimed. Namikaze household. Naruto, Kagura, Urza, and Kashina all sat down, each happily slurping at a bowl of miso ramen. Your ramen is the best, Ms. Namikaze. Kagura exclaimed. Why thank you. Kagura-chan. Kashina said, yeah, it really was a great lunch, Ms. Namikaze. Urza said, I've got to get home quick before my parents blow a fuse. Same here, Kagura said, see you later, Naruto, Urza. Bye Urza, bye Kagura, Naruto said, Naruto, come help me with the dishes. Kashina said, looking longingly at a small photo that was propped up against a window. It was a picture taken when Naruto was five, and the picture itself was of Naruto with Minato and Kashina standing behind them, each having a smile on their faces. Minato was a spiky blonde-haired man with black streaks in it standing at 5 feet 8 inches with bright blue eyes and fair skin. He wore a dark blue long-sleeved shirt with a red swirl-like symbol on his left shoulder and a red fairy-like symbol on his right shoulder and dark blue pants. Hey mom, Naruto said, breaking Kashina out of her trance-like state. When do you think I can start learning magic? Soon, Sochi, soon. Kashina said, a bittersweet smile on her face as she lied to her son. Neither she nor her husband had the courage to tell their son the truth. Within all of Earthland, only 10% of the population could use magic. And Naruto just happened to be part of the 90% that couldn't, despite both his parents being mages. There was the option of implanting a lacrima in Naruto but the mortality rate for the operation was 86%. So Naruto would never be able to use magic, or become a mage, but she would love him all the same either way. Kashina suddenly perked up, sensing a buildup of magic nearby. Despite having been retired for some time, Kashina had not lost her ability to sense magic. And this magic felt, explosive. Mom, Naruto called out, sensing that his mother was on edge. Naruto, I want you to head out the back door and run. Go, now, Kashina exclaimed, her son doing as told. As Naruto got halfway out the back door, it happened. Boom, the magical buildup Kashina had sensed was released in a burst of energy, creating a large explosion that consumed most of the house. Kashina took the brunt of the explosion, but Naruto was still affected. The explosion sent the young boy flying before he crashed into a tree. Naruto's vision had begun to blur, the sounds of nearby explosions being but a whisper-like sound. The majority of his body was covered in cuts, bruises, and burns. 
The last thing Naruto heard amidst the sounds of explosions and screams was a lone voice that stood out among the rest. Hum, I've finally found the one I'm searching for. One week later, Plagueis stared at the unconscious form of Naruto, whose body was surrounded by light blue distortions of the force. His midi-chlorian count must be immense, Plagueis thought, having noticed the young boy's midi-chlorian being stimulated from the Sith magic that was healing his body. It's strange, really, his midi-chlorians seem to be similar to Master Tenebrous's maxi-chlorians, yet, at the same time they feel vastly different. Perhaps all this Sith magic has stimulated inactive midi-chlorians too. Begin agamogenesis, he thought in confusion, but I thought that was impossible! Exclamation mark. Unless, the Sith magic caused the midi-chlorians to go through agamogenesis at a faster pace than red blood cells could be produced. Plagueis, having taken an ethereal form through the Force, had his eyes widen in realization. Of course, with an excess amount produced, the midi-chlorians had to attach themselves to new cells. An. Just a warning. I have absolutely no clue if this is actually true. I'm basing this off the theory that midi-chlorians are similar to a virus without the exploding red blood cells, and, well, the virus part. Plagueis was broken from thought when he saw Naruto began to stir. Naruto grunted out, his vision swimming as he tried to move his body. Ah, you're finally awake. Plagueis called out, who, who's there, show yourself, Naruto exclaimed, trying to sit up, only to fall back down wincing in pain. The young boy tired to look around his surroundings, only for his eyes to widen in shock as his eyes fell on his own body. Various recently closed scars littered his body, most likely from the chunks of wood and shrapnel that had made its way onto his body in the explosion he was caught in. I'd advise against any strenuous activity, your body is still recovering. You took quite the blow back there, Plagueis said, extending his hand and using the force to levitate Naruto in the air. Naruto struggled, unused to the feeling of weightlessness. Whoa, who are you? Why are you blue? What kind of magic are you using? What, what happened to my body? Naruto asked. My name is Hego Damask, but you may call me Darth Plagueis, and I am not blue. I am an ethereal manifestation of my own link to the Force when I was alive. The only magic I use is Sith magic, and that is but a derivative of the Force. Plagueis replied, As for what happened to your body, though you weren't caught in the center of the explosion, your body was still injured in the process. I was able to heal your wounds, but the scars still remain. W.H. Where am I? Naruto asked. We are currently on the outskirts of Rosemary Village. Rather, What's left of it? Plagueis stated. It was then that Naruto finally took notice of his surroundings, his eyes widening in shock. The few buildings and houses that once stood in the village were reduced to nothing but smoldering piles of ashes and rubble. But that was not what concerned Naruto. Put me down, Naruto demanded. You're still recovering from the explo, Plagueis started. I said put me down. Naruto yelled, Plagueis conceding and doing as told. Naruto plopped down on the ground, forcing himself back up despite the pain. The moment he got back on his own two feet, he began limping. The limping slowly turned into walking, and the walking soon turned into a full-blown running. My house is over there, Naruto thought, running as fast as his legs would carry him. Nothing hit my house, once I turn that corner, my house will still be there. His train of thought was cut off as he rounded about the street corner his eyes widening and his heart racing. Where his house once stood, was nothing but piles of smoldering remains and rubble. No, Naruto muttered, falling to his knees as tears fell freely from his face. I knew you would not like what you saw, but you insisted on seeing it with your own eyes, Plagueis stated. No, no, she has to be alive, mom has to still be alive, Naruto exclaimed, running up to the remains of his house and sifting through the wreckage. After a minute, he stopped and began bawling. I'm truly sorry for your loss, child, Plagueis said, placing an ethereal hand on Naruto's shoulder. W what about Urza, and Kagura, and Simon, Naruto questioned. They were all taken, Plagueis replied. W why, Naruto asked. It is uncertain, though, the people that destroyed this village kept saying something about resurrecting someone by the name of Zirf, Plagueis replied. Z Zirf, 
The Black Wizard, Naruto muttered, Zirf, he, he's the reason this all happened. He's the reason why those people attacked. He's the reason why they destroyed the village. He's the reason mom is dead. Unbeknownst to him, Naruto's royal purple eyes began to change, becoming a sick yellow in color. This did not go unnoticed by Plagueis, though. Already does the dark side of the force flow strongly through him. And at such a young age, too, Plagueis thought, you must want revenge on this, Zirf, person. Revenge, Naruto mumbled, suddenly, he began to laugh. It started out as a small chuckle, but quickly turned into a full-blown laugh of a madman. Yes, that's what I'll do. I'll destroy any trace left by the Black Wizard. I can help you, Plagueis stated, catching Naruto's attention. You have a certain power that the rest of these people don't. I can help you learn to control it. And with this power, only then, will you be able to have your revenge. I, I accept, Naruto said, his sick yellow eyes beginning to glow as he stood back up. Good, Plagueis said, from this day forward, you shall be known as Darth. Revan. Eleven years later, Anabu's town. The sounds of mind-numbing chatter permeated throughout the area like a dense fog, smoke coming out of the nearby stationary train. Through the large dense crowd of people going about their lives, a cloaked Naruto went unnoticed by those around him. Over the years, Naruto had certainly grown, the black-haired man now standing at 5 feet 11 inches, and everything he wore was concealed by the black cloak he had adorned. Attention all passengers, the 915 train to Harjan Town will be departing in 5 minutes. A man said over the announcement speakers. The cloaked man walked on board the train, handing the conductor his ticket and entering one of the compartment cars. Will there be anything you would like to order? The trip to Harjan Town will take us some time, one of the train's waiters asked. No thank you, I'm good for now, Naruto said, getting a nod from the waiter before he left, closing the compartment car's door. A minute after the door closed, a sigh escaped Naruto's lips as he pulled his cloak off and placed it on the seat in front of him. Naruto's spiky black hair had grown slightly shaggier, his once sick yellow eyes had changed slightly, becoming a golden yellow color, and his whisker marks had become more feral. He wore a black long-sleeved shirt, a dark red sash around his waist, black baggy pants, and dark gray open-toed sandals. On top of all this, Naruto wore armored plating on his shoulders and at his waist, and two crossed belts that holstered eight strange-looking knives. I do hope that this rumor you've heard turns out to be true, Revan. I'm growing tired of following dead-end trails, Plagueis said, his ghostly ethereal form materializing in the seat opposite of Naruto. Trust me, I have a feeling that this one won't be another dead end like the others. Naruto stated, the man may be known for slipping out of trouble like sand through an open hand, but he's also the go-to person for any information about anything. And you believe he will just give you the information you want? Plagueis questioned, a hint of sarcasm in his voice as he spoke. Of course not, Naruto said, holding up his hand as black lightning cackled around it, a sadistic smile coming across his face. I'll just have to, make him comply. At this, Plagueis shook his head, a chuckle escaping his lips. HMPH, truly, I do pity this, Bora of prominence, fellow. Plagueis stated. Unknown location, dream sequence start, a young eight-year-old Urza looked around confusingly. R. Rosemary Village, the young Urza questioned aloud. The images seen by the young red-haired girl soon began to change. The pristine condition of her home village was soon replaced by the image forever burned into her memory. Fire was raging all around her, the anguished sounds of the people she once knew echoing throughout the air, and lastly, her own house collapsing in from the fire, her parents' screams of agony being clearly heard beneath the burning rubble that was once their house. This burning scenery soon began to fade, only to be replaced by the setting of her nightmares. Dark, Gloomy clouds rolled overhead as she and several other children, including Simon and Kagura, were forced to build the very thing they were captured for, a devastating magical structure that, if provided enough magical energy, could restore life, known as the Tower of Heaven. The scenery changed once more, to where she was falling out of the incomplete Tower of Heaven, having been thrown out by one of the few other slaves she made a bond with. The person had blue hair, brown eyes, an oddly shaped tattoo on his right eye, and a sadistic grin on his face. 
The person began to fade as she got farther and farther away, being replaced with her childhood friend, Naruto Namikaze. Urza, the childish voice of her friend, Naruto, cried out. His voice seemed like little more than a whisper, but got loud each time he spoke. Urza, 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 Naruto's form suddenly began to change with each exclamation, being replaced by a taller and older version of Naruto with glowing yellow eyes with black lightning cackling around his body. With one swift movement, Naruto's hand shot out and a stream of lightning came at her. Dream sequence end, Urza, Kagura exclaimed, waking Urza up from her nightmare. The red-haired woman jolted up, sweaty and hyperventilating. It was just a dream. Just a dream, Urza thought as she calmed down and caught her breath. Urza, over the past decade, had blossomed into a beautiful young woman, standing at five feet nine inches with long, scarlet hair, fair skin, a slender, voluptuous figure, and deep brown eyes. Her attire consisted of a custom-made heart cruise armor, a blue skirt, black boots, and a blue fairy-like mark was on the middle of her left upper arm. Another nightmare, Kagura asked, though she already knew the answer to her question. She knew all too well what Urza and herself had gone through in the Tower of Heaven. She too had grown over the years. Kagura was now a young, slim, large busted woman, standing at 5 feet 8 inches with long, straight purple hair that was cut, Heim style, and fell to the middle of her back. Kagura had donned an elaborate blazer with gold lining, and a large collar, which was open to reveal a collared shirt and red tie underneath. The cuffs of this jacket were tucked into a pair of white wrist high gloves with the same fairy like mark that Urza had, only hers was light blue. On her legs, Kagura wore a pair of black tights, which were tucked into a pair of knee high boots and sat under a short white frilled skirt. She also wore a white headband with a white ribbon tied at the middle in a bow, pointing straight up. This was different than the other ones, Urza said, staring at the ground in front of her. How so? Kagura questioned grabbing her white and gold-oriented katana, Fugitaden. Well, Naruto was in it this time, Urza said, causing Kagura to freeze up. Naruto, their childhood friend, she still remember those days, and that day as well. Flashback start, Naruto, Urza, the young Kagura called out in fear, the buildings surrounding her burning and screams filling the air. Kagura, Urza exclaimed, Kagura turned around to find Urza running towards her fear evident in her eyes as well. What's going on? Where's Simon? Where's Naruto? They, they took Simon. They killed mom and dad and took Simon. Kagura cried. Urza pulled her into a hug. What about Naruto? Do you know what happened to him? Urza asked. I don't know. I'm trying to find him. Kagura replied. Maybe he's at his house. Urza said, grabbing Kagura's hand. Come on, let's hurry. Hey. I found two over here. A dark mage exclaimed. Run, Urza yelled, going as fast as her feet would carry her. Stop them, un, the dark mage exclaimed. Hurry, Kagura, Urza exclaimed. I'm running as fast as I can. Kagura cried out, the duo rounding about a corner, only to abruptly stop in their tracks once they saw the wreckage that was once Naruto's house. Humph, you two are very irritating, un, running off like that. The dark mage from before stated, grabbing both girls by the collars of their outfits. What did you do to Naruto? Urza yelled. Naruto. Never heard of him. Though there was this blonde kid I found out in the direction you were running. The dark mage said, causing Urza and Kagura to freeze up. That brat didn't even stand a chance against my explosion mate, C3. Now, come, let's go and get you to your, new, lives. Biwahahaha. Flashback end, a lone tear fell down Kagura face at the memory before she quickly wiped it away. Naruto was, different, though. He, I can't exactly remember most of what he looked like, but I do remember these glowing yellow eyes. Urza stated. An omen, perhaps, Kagura questioned. It's probably just a bad dream. Urza said. Yeah, just a bad dream. All right then, come on, we've got a monster to slay. Kagura said. Urza standing up and walking away from their makeshift campsite off to their destination. Harjun Town Harjun was one of Fury's most beautiful old town, prospering from its fishing industry and harbor. As the train pulled into the station, a groaning could be heard near the vehicle's exit. Ah! A man groaned out. 
The man was lean and muscular, standing at 5 feet 9 inches with a slightly tan skin tone, black eyes, and spiky pink-colored hair. He wore a sleeveless, gold-trimmed, dark red waistcoat that was left opened and untucked, exposing his bare chest, white knee-length trousers, a thick black wristband on his left wrist, black open-toed sandals, a scale-patterned scarf, and a large hiking backpack. Um, sir, the train conductor called out. Natsu, we're here, Harjin, a strange blue cat exclaimed. Get up, get up. Is he okay? The conductor asked. I, he always gets like this. The blue cat said. I can't handle it. The pink-haired man, now identified as Natsu, said. Suddenly, Natsu found himself levitating above the ground. Need a hand, Naruto called out, his cloak back on opened slightly with the hood down. Don't worry, I'll handle this. The conductor said a quickly, thank you, before walking away as Naruto, Natsu, and the blue cat exited the train. Thanks for the save back there, Natsu said after Naruto placed him back on the ground. I'm Natsu Dragneel, by the way, and this is my partner, Happy. I. The blue cat, now identified as Happy, exclaimed. Nice to meet you, Natsu. My name's Naruto. Naruto replied, So, what brings you to Harjin? Well, Natsu started, only to be cut off by the girlish scream of a creature far more sinister than any demon, fangirls. It's Salamander Sama, a fangirl exclaimed. Salamander, Natsu and Happy exclaimed, running off in the direction of the crowd of fangirls. Salamander. Naruto questioned as he slowly followed after Natsu and Happy. See, talk about somebody and they show up. Natsu said, only to arrive on a different scene than they had hoped for. Standing in the center of a crowd of fangirls was a tall and slim man, standing at 5 feet 10 inches with mildly short, spiky blue hair jutting outwards, with a long fringe left hanging over the upper left part of his face. He possessed a mildly rectangular face with sharp features, dark eyes and thin, dark eyebrows. His most distinctive facial feature was the dark tattoo covering the right part of his forehead, just above his right eyebrow, the symbol being resembling a thin, stylized pair of tongs placed horizontally, with the handles pointing towards him. He wore ornate clothing, with the most visible piece being a dark, high-collared cape almost reaching down to his knees possessing a lighter inner part and light edges adorned by a pattern consisting of many rongs lined up one after the other. Such cape was closed some centimeters below the man's neck by a small fastener adorned by a stylized flame, with a light ribbon hanging from it, and had large motifs adorning its sides, starting from the shoulders and going down several inches. Each motif was shaped like a large, light and hollow circle from whose outer side many arrows jutted outwards in every direction, and which had several wavy lines protruding towards its hollow center. Below such cape, the man wore a simple, light short-sleeved shirt with outlined edges, paired with light pinstriped pants with visible hems, held up by a simple belt covered in elongated spots and largely hidden by his shirt, and polished dark shoes, with lighter soles and a light upper part going down from the ankle's front. He also sported three large metal bracelets around his left and right wrist and forearm and two strange rings on his right index and middle fingers. Lovely, cool, a few of the girls exclaimed. Why is my heart beating this fast? A young woman mentally questioned. The woman stood at 5 feet 7 inches with brown eyes and shoulder-length blonde hair tied by by a blue ribbon into a small ponytail to the right side of her head with the rest of her hair loose. She was buxom, and had a curvaceous body. She wore a white and blue sleeveless shirt, a blue skirt, and a brown belt that held strange keys of gold and silver coloration and a whip. Hey, what's gotten into me? Captivated, aren't you? The man chuckled, before looking at the blonde woman. He looked at me, the blonde woman mentally exclaimed. Am I this excited because he's a famous wizard? Could it be, is he the one? Igneal, Natsu exclaimed, only to stop when he saw that the person in question was not who he was looking for, accidentally breaking the man's charm magic spell. Who the heck are you? He questioned, causing the man to comically turn white. If I said salamander, would that ring a bell? The man questioned, raising his right hand up as the charm magic took effect. By the time he did so, Natsu and Happy were already walking away. He's already gone. How rude of you, a girl exclaimed, almost kicking Natsu in the back, but was stopped by an invisible force that immobilized her in midair. 
There's no need to get so violent. Naruto casually said, his right hand raised as he immobilized four more fangirls. Now, now, just leave it at that. It's not like he meant any harm by it. The man that was called, Salamander, stated. He's so kind, the crowd of fangirls exclaimed, save for the blonde-haired woman. Here is my autograph, feel free to show it off to your friends. Salamander, said, handing a deadpanning Natsu a signature that said, Salamander. No thanks, Natsu said, only to be attacked by a ravenous wild group of fangirls, effectively knocking him down into a pile of trash. I guess we got the wrong person, Happy stated. Now then, I have some business at the next port, so if you'll excuse me. Salamander, said. What, you're leaving already? The fangirls complained. Red carpet, Salamander, exclaimed, snapping his fingers as a small purple blaze appeared beneath him, lifting him off the ground. I'm having a party on my ship this evening. Everyone, please attend. Of course, the fangirls exclaimed as, Salamander, flew off. Why didn't you go for the opportunity? Plagueis questioned, no others taking notice of him. Too many witnesses, Naruto whispered, who the heck was that guy? Natsu asked, what a scumbag. The blonde-haired woman stated, causing Naruto, Natsu, and Happy to turn their heads in her direction. Thanks a lot, huh? Natsu questioned, Harjin Restaurant, I'm Lucy, nice to meet you. The blonde-haired woman, now identified as Lucy, stated. I, Happy exclaimed as Natsu practically inhaled the food in front of him while Naruto quietly slurped on a bowl of miso ramen. Natsu and Happy, was it? And you said your name was Naruto, right? Lucy questioned. You're really nice, Natsu exclaimed, not even stopping for a breath as he inhaled more food. Thanks, sure, just take your time and, I'm kind of in the splash zone here. Dot dot quote, Lucy said, only for the incoming flying food to bounce off of an invisible force. Single quote dot dot dot, and there goes that 1000 jewel I saved with my looks, she thought, sending Naruto a grateful look. See, that, salamander, guy was using a charm spell, a type of hypnosis spell. That kind of magic can make people attracted to you, but its sale was banned years ago. He'd go that far just to be popular. What a creepy jerk, Lucy stated. But thanks to you two barging and the charm was lifted, so this is my way of saying thanks. I see, Natsu mumbled out, thank you, Naruto said. I know I don't seem like it, but I'm actually a wizard myself. I haven't joined a guild yet, though, Lucy said before turning to one side. Oh yeah, guilds are places where wizards gather to share information and take on jobs. You can't be said to be a full-fledged mage unless you've joined a guild. Who are you talking to? Naruto interrupted, causing Lucy to sweat drop. You know, them, Lucy said hesitantly before shaking her head. But, but, there are guilds all over the world, and it's really difficult to get into the popular ones, see. The one I want to get into, see, has like a ton of amazing mages, and. Oh, what am I to do? I want to join up, but I bet it's really tough. Uh, Natsu said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just blabbing on about the world of mages and stuff. This is all gibberish to you, isn't it? Lucy questioned. Yes, yes it is. Naruto deadpanned, but I'm totally going to join that guild. I bet that I could get a bunch of big jobs with them. Lucy exclaimed. Why you think? Natsu questioned. You sure talk a lot. Happy said. Oh yeah, it looked like you guys were searching for someone. Lucy said. I, Igneal. Happy exclaimed, I'd heard that a salamander had come to this town, so it's good we checked it out. Natsu said, but I guess it was someone else. I'm here searching for someone else, I just so happened to meet these two at the train station. Naruto stated, he didn't look like a salamander. Happy said, they're fire dragons, so I really thought it would be Igneal. Natsu stated, fire dragon, Naruto questioned, what kind of human looks like a fire dragon? Lucy questioned. He's not human. Igneal's an actual dragon, Natsu said, getting a comical look of disbelief from both Lucy and Naruto. I, Happy exclaimed. He's a real dragon, something like that wouldn't be in the middle of a town. Lucy comically exclaimed. 
Why would you think a giant dragon would just enter a largely populated town and not be noticed? Naruto deadpanned, causing Natsu and Happy to freeze up in realization. You just realized this, now. Lucy exclaimed before placing a thousand jewel on the table. Anyway, I have to get going, so take your time boys. I must take my leave as well, I have leads I need to follow before they go cold. Naruto said, standing up and walking out alongside Lucy. Thank you, come again, one of the waitresses said, only to gain a comical look of shock. Naruto and Lucy turned their heads in the same direction, only for Lucy to gain the same expression as the waitress and Naruto to raise an eyebrow. We appreciate your kindness, Natsu and Happy exclaimed, bowing to Lucy. Stop it already, you're embarrassing me, Lucy exclaimed. I'm pretty sure you're doing that on your own at this point. Naruto deadpanned. It's fine, okay, you saved me back there, so we're even now, k. Lucy said. But we weren't trying to save you or anything. Natsu said. I, no payment needed, Happy said. That's it, you can have this, Natsu said, pulling out the autograph from, Salamander. Who'd want that, Lucy yelled. Harjan Park, an hour later. Lucy was sitting on a park bench reading the latest edition of Weekly Sorcerer. Oh my, fairy tales caused trouble again. The Devon Thieves gang wiped out along with seven residences. Dot dot, man, they just go overboard. Lucy exclaimed. Ooh, a photo spread of Mirajan. For quite a few of the pages, there was a full page photo spread of a white haired, slim young woman that stood at five feet six inches, wearing various bikinis that showed off her curvaceous figure. But how exactly does one join fairy tale? I wonder if they have an interview or something. Lucy questioned. The mages guild, fairy tale. They're just the coolest. So you want to join fairy tale? Salamander, questioned, popping out of a nearby bush. S Salamander, Lucy exclaimed. I was looking for you. I wanted to invite you personally to the party on my ship. Salamander, said. Your charm won't work on me. That magic's weak point is awareness. Lucy stated, it doesn't work on people who know it's being used. As I thought, I realized the moment I saw you that you were a mage. Salamander, stated, no matter, as long as you come to the party. There's no way I'd go. Not to a party thrown by a scumbag like you. Lucy said, I'm a scumbag, Salamander, comically questioned. She's not wrong, Naruto called out, causing Lucy and salamander to turn their heads in the direction he was coming from you'd go so far as to use a charm to be popular and there are a few other things that i know that you'd rather not have brought into light salamander naruto stated stressing salamander's name causing said mage's eyes to widen it's part of the ceremony see i just wanted the party to have a celebrity as a host see salamander stated i can't believe a famous mage is such an idiot Lucy said. You wanted to join Fairy Tale, yes. Haven't you heard of Fairy Tale's Salamander? Salamander, questioned. I have, you're one of Fairy Tale's mages. Lucy questioned. Yeah, are you one of Fairy Tale's mages? Naruto reiterated, his golden yellow eyes beginning to glow menacingly. That's right, Salamander, replied nervously under the intense gaze of Naruto before regaining his composure. If you want to join, I'll put a word in with the guild master. The party sounds like it'll be wonderful, doesn't it? Lucy said, her personality pulling a 180 o. You're easy to figure out, you know that. Salamander, said. Hey, do you really think I can get into fairy tale? Lucy asked. Of course, Salamander, replied. But in return, keep quiet about the charm, okay? Sure thing, Lucy said. We shall meet again at the party, then. Salamander, exclaimed before flying off using red carpet. Yes sir, Lucy exclaimed. The moment, Salamander, was out of listening range, her personality went back to what it was before. He used a pseudo charm. But, all right, I can join fairy tale. Until then, I've got to play nice with that dumb oaf. This is going to be a piece of cake, Naruto. She said, turning to where Naruto was, only to find him missing. Naruto. Lucy looked around for the black haired mage, but it was like he had disappeared. Oh well, she mumbled, 
sitting back down as she continued reading her edition of Weekly Sorcerer. Oh, an article on, a dark mage, Lucy read aloud hesitantly. The page she had turned to appeared to have an image of a hooded figure wearing a black cloak, with black lightning cackling around his hands. On the bottom right part of the page was another image of the dark mage, only this one had him behind a kneeling man, black lightning frozen in place around the dark mage's hands as he stood above the man in preparation for an execution. This man's true name is unknown, but those who have survived encountering this dark mage have given him many monikers, such as, the Dark Swordsman, and, the Black Reaper. The Magic Council has labeled him an S-Class Dark Mage, though he hold no affiliation to any Dark Guild. Lucy read aloud, releasing a slight shiver of fear. I don't think I'd be able to take on a mage like that, not yet at least. And not without help. Unknown location, Salamanders. Red Carpet finally touched down in a nearby alley, his happy mood turning sour as a frown appeared on his face. Strange, don't you think, how a fairy tale mage like you would be found in a town like this? Naruto called out, walking out of the shadows with his hood up. You nearly blew my cover, you know that, right? Salamander, said, what do you want? What makes you think that I want something from you, Bora of Prominence? Naruto said, using, Salamander's, true name, making the man flinch. Now, I want information. Information about a little rumor I heard in my travels. What exactly do you mean by that? Salamander, aka, Bora of Prominence, questioned. I heard a rumor about a dark guild that is nearing the end of their search for finding one of Zeref's magical items. Naruto stated. Yeah, I heard about that. One of the big dark guilds, Eisenwald. Bora stated. From what I've heard, the mages from that guild are planning something big, and it somehow involves something called a lullaby. And how do I know that your information is true? Naruto questioned, causing Bora to narrow his eyes. This came from a very reliable source of mine, who got this information off of one of the more loose-lipped members of Eisenwald. Bora said, any other information you want to blackmail out of me? Hum, now that I think about it, Naruto said, his eyes beginning to glow causing Bora to stiffen and go into a trance-like state. You're going to tell me everything you know that's even remotely related to Zirf. Later that day, the sun had already set, night replacing day as Natsu and Happy relaxed from a day of dead-end searches. What a meal, Natsu exclaimed, I, Happy exclaimed before looking out to the waters. Oh yeah, is that the ship? Salamanders, party is at. Gonna hurl, Natus groaned out. The mere mention of any form of transportation enough to get the pink-haired mage nauseous. Stop getting queasy just from thinking about it. Happy said. Look at that. That's Salamander Sama's ship. A girl exclaimed. I wish I had gone. A second girl said. Salamander. A third girl questioned. You don't know him. He's the famous fairy tale mage that came to town. The first girl stated, catching Natsu and Happy's attention. Fairy tale. Natsu questioned, looking at, Salamander's, ship before quickly getting nauseous. Fairy tale. Aboard, Salamander's, ship. On board the ship, various women were dressed up and partying. Lucy was C, was it? What a pretty name, Salamander, stated. Thanks, Lucy said, let's start off with a toast. Salamander, said, pouring a glass of champagne for Lucy. With a snap of his fingers, the orange bubbly liquid floated out of the glass. Now, open wide, and savor the fruit-flavored gems as they enter your mouth. I've got to deal with it. Gotta hang in there, Lucy thought, almost doing as instructed, but smacked the floating orange liquid away at the last second. What's the meaning of this? That's magic to knock people out, sleep. You're pretty sharp, Bora said, dropping the guise as, Salamander. Don't get any ideas, I want to join Fairy Tale, but I have no intention of being your woman. Lucy stated. What a handful you are, girly. Bora exclaimed, the curtains that hung around the makeshift room opening to reveal a bunch of other men all carrying unconscious women. What the heck is this? Lucy exclaimed. Welcome to my ship, please be good until we reach Bosco, Missy. Bora said. Bosco, what about Fairy Tale? Lucy questioned. Give it up, you're our merchandise now, Bora stated. That's, then, 
the other girls. Lucy said. That's our salamander San. One of the men exclaimed. We got ourselves quite a haul this time. Another man said. Why, you, Lucy said, pulling out her gold and silver keys, only for them to be snatched out of her hand by a fire make spell, courtesy of Bora. Gate keys. So you're a celestial mage. This magic can only be used by the contract holders. In other words, these are useless to me. Bora stated, throwing the keys into the ocean. What's the matter with this guy? What a horrible thing to do. Lucy thought, so this, so this is what it means to be a fairy tale mage. Using magic for evil and tricking people. That's the worst kind of mage there is. She exclaimed, her thoughts becoming vocalized, tears streaming down her face. It was then that a chilling omniscient aura blanketed the area, causing all that were on the receiving end to freeze up in fear. My, my, Bora San, is this how you get your information? From a slave ring, Naruto called out, his dark hood up and leaving nothing visible but his glowing yellow eyes. I it's the Black Reaper. One of the men exclaimed. But what's he doing here? Another man questioned. Before any answer could be said, the roof of the ship exploded into splinters, with Natsu appearing out of the smoldering wood. Natsu, Lucy exclaimed. Seconds later, Natsu looked like he was about to hurl, getting a comical look of disbelief from everyone, including Naruto. As I thought, it's no use. Natsu thought. Lame. Naruto called out. Lucy, what are you doing? Happy called out, floating above the hole Natsu came through with his, wings. Happy, I was tricked. He said he'd help me join Fairy Tail. Lucy stated, wait, since when did you have wings? Leave that for later. Run away, Happy exclaimed, grabbing Lucy with his tail and flying off. After her, it'll be trouble if the council gets wind of this. Bora exclaimed. Actually, Naruto called out, raising his hand and, with a flick of his wrist, all of Bora's lackeys, and Natsu, were sent flying in all directions. The black-cloaked Naruto then began slowly walking towards Bora, who began to back up when he saw black lightning cackling in Naruto's hands. I think you should focus on the trouble at hand, Bora. With Happy and Lucy, hey, what about Natsu? Lucy questioned as Happy carried her far above the ocean. I can't carry two people, Happy said. Boom, was the resonating sound that came from the ship below. What was that? Lucy asked. The duo looked down to the ship to find the cloaked Naruto fighting Bora, and Natsu being kicked around by some of the lackeys that had recovered from being flung back. Prominence whip, Bora exclaimed, turning his attention to Lucy and Happy. Several streams of purple flames shot out at the airborne duo, only to be dispersed by an equal amount of black lightning streams. Black lightning, Lucy exclaimed, her eyes widening in shock. That must be the Black Reaper. With Naruto. Why are you doing this, Naruto? Bora questioned, dodging a punch thrown by Naruto. Because you know of my true identity. I can't take the risk of you revealing who I am just yet. Naruto stated, therefore the best course of actions would be, to eliminate you. With Happy and Lucy, I've got to save Natsu and the other girls. Lucy exclaimed. Lucy, listen up. Happy said. What is it now? Lucy asked. My transformation ran out. Happy replied, his wings disappearing and leaving both the blue cat and Lucy hanging in the air for about a second before falling down to the deep blue below. You damned cat. Lucy yelled as she plunged into the ocean. Once she got in the waters she began to swim, unlike Happy who immediately knocked his head against a rock. Lucy began to swim towards a small glistening light in the water, her hopes confirmed to be true as she got closer and closer. There they are, she mentally exclaimed, grabbing her gate keys from the rock before swimming up to the surface, along with a dazed happy. Here I go, gate of the water bearer, I open thee, Aquarius. Lucy exclaimed, pulling out one of her three golden keys, a bell chime being heard throughout the area as a mermaid-like woman appeared. The woman stood at six feet one inch and had a long, blue fish tail, light blue hair, and a large bust. She had blue eyes with no pupils, and wore a dark blue bikini top. On each arm, she had a golden armlet and bracelet. Aquarius also had a headband, three piercings on her tail, and a golden belt at her waist. A dark blue tattoo resembling the Aquarius zodiac symbol rested right under her collarbone. A fish, 
Happy exclaimed. Um, no, Lucy said. Wow, Happy said. I'm a celestial wizard, see. I use gate keys to call celestial spirits from an alternate dimension. Lucy stated before pointing towards the ship. Aquarius, use your power and sweep that ship up onto the shore. T-C-H. Aquarius grunted. Did you, perhaps, just say, T-C-H, to me? Lucy comically exclaimed. You really shouldn't complain like that. Happy stated. What an annoying girl you are. Aquarius stated. Let me tell you something. The next time you drop my key, I'll kill you. S sorry. Lucy and Happy exclaimed in fear. Aquarius relented, throwing a tidal wave of water in comical rage, sending the ship that Bora, Natsu, and Naruto were on flying towards the harbor. Don't sweep me away, too. Lucy yelled but was too late as she and Happy were sent ashore as well. What were you thinking? You think it's normal to sweep me up, too? She questioned when she saw Aquarius. Alas, I failed. I ended up sweeping the ship as well. Aquarius stated. You were aiming for me. Lucy exclaimed. Do not call me for a while. I will be on vacation for a week with my boyfriend. Aquarius said. With my boyfriend. With that last retort, Aquarius vanished in a flash of light. Don't rub it in, Lucy exclaimed. Hey, Lucy, maybe I shouldn't have apologized back then. Happy questioned. This cat's so oblivious, I don't even know where to start. Lucy mumbled. With Naruto. Ugh. Bora groaned, rolling so that he could see the starry night. But instead, he was greeted to the sight of the Black Reaper. Humph. So this is it. This is how you end. Naruto stated his cloak parting slightly as four of the strange knives he carried on him levitated out. With a flick of his wrist, Naruto's knives suddenly began to change, extending in length until they were each ten inches long. W wait, please, I I could be of use, Bora exclaimed, crawling back as he desperately tried to escape his impending demise. I I could supply you with more information, I I could pay you, I could. You are of no use to me anymore. Naruto interrupted, flicking his wrist so one of his knives impaled itself into Bora's right shoulder. I have all the information I need from you, and money is of no concern to me. Another knife impaled itself into Bora's left shoulder, the remaining two knives positioning themselves around Bora's neck, the edges of the blades drawing a small amount of blood. Plus, with you dead, my identity shall remain a secret. Why you can't keep your identity a secret forever? Bora exclaimed only for his eyes to widen and remain that way. I know, but I can only delay the inevitable. Naruto mumbled, golden yellow eyes staring back into the dead dark eyes of Bora, blood seeped from the newly minted open wound that Naruto inflicted on him causing an instant death for Bora. You, Natsu called out, causing Naruto to turn in his direction. You killed him. He was but a pawn in a much larger plan. Naruto replied, motioning his hand to one of the fires that had broken out nearby causing the flames to leap forward at the pink-haired man. Natsu, Lucy exclaimed, seeing her newly found friend being engulfed in flames. She tried to run after Natsu, but was stopped by Happy. I take no pleasure in killing people such as yourself. Too much innocent blood has already been spilt. Naruto muttered, turning away from the flames and walking away. Gross, Natsu called out, causing Naruto to stop in his tracks. You may not be a fire mage, but still. I can't believe how gross this fire tastes. Both Naruto and Lucy were shocked to find the flames being eaten by an unharmed Natsu, who just grinned in response. Thanks for the meal. Oh, this certainly makes things interesting. Naruto said. Fire isn't going to work on Natsu. Happy said to Lucy. I've heard of a magic like this, but I never thought I would ever see it with my own two eyes. Naruto mumbled. I've never seen magic like that, Lucy stated, now that I've eaten, I'm all revved up, Natsu said, walking towards Naruto, who made no attempt to run. Here I go, fire dragons roar, he exclaimed, taking a deep inhale before spewing a large stream of fire. Naruto raised his hand up, using the force to part the fire before it consumed him. Salamander, Lucy exclaimed in realization of who Natsu was. That man may have been impersonating a fairy tale mage, but I'll show you what a real fairy tale mage is. Natsu exclaimed, fire engulfing his hands as he charged at Naruto, 
who promptly dodged the flaming fists and struck back with a force push that sent Natsu colliding into a building. Natsu quickly got out of the rubble and shook the dust off his shoulders before charging up his fists with flames once more and charged right back at Naruto. He eats fire, and punches with fire. Is that really magic? Lucy questioned. A dragon's lung to breath flames, a dragon's scales to dissolve flames, a dragon's claws to wrap in flames. It's magic that transforms your own body parts into those of a dragon's. An ancient spell, Happy stated. What's that? Lucy asked. It was originally magic used to deal with dragons. Happy said. Is this the best you've got? Naruto questioned. I truly expected more from one who uses dragon slayer magic. Igneal taught it to Natsu. Happy added. Listen up, jerk. I'm gonna smoke you to a smoldering crisp. Natsu exclaimed glaring at Naruto's glowing eyes before pounding his fists together, causing a magic seal to appear in the shape of a dragon's head. Take this, fire dragon's iron fist, he yelled, charging at Naruto with a flaming fist, only for Naruto to dodge and use force push again, only this time he sent Natsu crashing into Happy and Lucy. Natsu, you don't smoke things using flames, Happy groaned out, isn't this going a bit overboard? Lucy's sweat dropped, Despite being knocked down, even she could see the destruction Natsu's magic had caused. I, Happy exclaimed, I, nothing, Lucy yelled. Suddenly, the same chilling feeling from before came across her as Naruto levitated over to the trio. You three will be quite a bother in the coming future. Yet, I shall let you live for now, Naruto stated, his glowing eyes menacingly staring down at Natsu, Happy, and Lucy. Until next time he said before hovering off. Just in time, too, as rune knights began appearing on the scene. The military, Lucy questioned, only for her to be grabbed by Natsu and dragged away flailing around. Crap, let's get out of here, Natsu exclaimed. Why are you taking me with you? Lucy comically yelled. Well, you wanted to join our guild, right? Fairy tale, Natsu questioned. Lucy having now only taken notice of Natsu's fairy-like mark on his right shoulder. A grin came across Natsu's face, causing Lucy to blush a little. Come with me. Sure, Lucy exclaimed, both mages running from the rune knights with a smile on their faces as they did so. With Naruto, Naruto hid from the rune knights that surrounded the area he was just in, pulling down the hood of his cloak to draw less attention to himself. That was a bold and risk move, Darth Revan. Plagueis stated, appearing beside Naruto. That dragon slayer mage was something I had not accounted for. Naruto stated, but I got the information I was searching for nonetheless, that, and much more. Still, your little shenanigan will draw more attention to you. And not in a good way, either. Plagueis said, so, where to now? For now, we lay our heads low for a week or two. Then, it's off to Oshibana town. Naruto replied, a menacing grin spreading across his face and his eyes beginning to glow. By then, Eisenwald should have acquired what they were searching for, and what I'm searching for as well. The Kingdom of Fury, a neutral country of 17 million people. It is a world of magic. Magic is bought and sold there every day. It is an integral part of people's lives. And there are those who use magic as their occupation. Those people are referred to as mages. The mages belong to various guilds and perform jobs on commission. There are a large number of guilds within the country. And in a certain city there lies a certain guild. A guild from which various legends were once born. Or rather, will continue to be born long into the future. And its name is. Fairy Tale. Naruto mumbled, thinking back to the guild that had become a wild factor in his plans. Naruto's cloak was on and his hood was up as the black-haired Sith walked down the empty path he was on. Rain heavily poured all around him, not seeming to be letting up anytime soon. A week's time had gone by, and, just as he had predicted, his trail had gone cold in Harjan town. And by the time those fools in the magic council get back on my trail, I'll be long gone from this place. Naruto thought, Plagueis materializing right beside him. I presume that a week's time has come and gone, Revan. Plagueis questioned. Indeed. You need to get a more concrete way of measuring time, master. Naruto stated. And how many times must I remind you? I am no longer your master, we are equals now. Plagueis corrected, to which Naruto stayed silent. 
By the way, I was able to find what you were searching for. This caught Naruto's attention. Oh, you did? Naruto asked. I was able to find three, actually. Plagueis replied. How far is it from our current position? Naruto questioned. Not as far as you'd expect. Although, there is one vital piece that's missing in all three. Plagueis stated. Hum, I understand. I will deal with this Eisenwald guild first and foremost before going after it. Naruto said. Contact me when you've finished with your own personal business. Plague said, getting a nod from Naruto before vanishing. The rain began to cease momentarily, the clouds parting ways to reveal the bright sun's beams of light. The calm before the storm. Naruto muttered before he continued walking down the path he was on, the clouds closing up to block the sun as the storm raged on. The black-haired force user eventually stumbled upon a sign alongside the pathway and knew he was going in the right direction, seeing as the sign read, Welcome to Anabu's Town. Fairy Tale Guild Hall, Magnolia Town. You're the one who provoked me, droopy eyes. Natsu exclaimed, glaring at shirtless man standing at 5 feet 9 inches with dark blue hair and dark blue eyes wearing only his pants and shoes. This man was Gary Fullbuster, resident ice make mage of Fairy Tale. When exactly did I provoke you, squinty eyes? Gray exclaimed. Talking underpants, Natsu retorted. Dimwit, Gray countered. It's third grader time, Lucy sweat dropped. Same as always, Happy said, causing all those present in the room to laugh. We've got trouble, a man with orange hair and hazel eyes wearing light blue shades exclaimed, running into the guild hall with panic clearly evident on his face. Urza and Kagura are back. The mere mention of these two names was enough to send every mage, save for Lucy and Mirajan, into a fit of fear. Urza San, Natsu mentioned her before, but I've never heard of Kagura, Lucy stated. I think it'd be correct to call those two the strongest female mages of fairy tale right now. Mirajan said, the entire guild was eerily silent, silent enough that even a small pin being dropped could be heard. The sound of two pairs of footsteps was all there was to penetrate the permeating silence. It's Urza and Kagura, a woman muttered. T that's Urza and Kagura's footsteps, a man muttered. Urza and Kagura are coming back, another man exclaimed. With this kind of reaction, Urza-san and Kagura-san really must be amazing mages. Lucy thought, imagining two giant demonic feminine silhouettes of women terrorizing the guild hall. Scary, she exclaimed. We have returned, Urza stated, walking in alongside Kagura holding a giant decorated horn nearly twice her size. Is master here? T they're pretty, Lucy muttered upon seeing Urza and Kagura in person. Welcome back, master is at the regular meeting, Mirajan replied. I see, Urza said, Urza San, Kagura San, what is that giant thing? One of the guild members asked. The horn of the monster we defeated, Kagura replied. The locals decorated it and gave it to us as a souvenir. Got a problem with it? No, not at all. The guild member exclaimed in fear. Think she knows about the incident on MT. Hako, a woman holding an oversized barrel of booze questioned. See crap, I'm dead meat. A man muttered. She's quite different than what I'd imagined. Lucy mumbled. All of you, I heard a bunch of rumors while I was gone. About how fairy tale keeps causing problems. Urza stated, Master might forgive you, but I will not. Kana, she exclaimed, causing the woman drinking from the barrel of booze to freeze up in fear. How dare you drink in such an undignified manner? Visitar, yes, take your dancing outside. Wakaba, you're dropping ash on the table. Nab, just hesitating in front of the request board as usual. Take a job, Macau. Urza didn't say anything to Macau, just sigh in irritation. Say something. Damn it! Macau cried out. Lee, Guy, Yash, two green monstrosities exclaimed simultaneously. Man, you all give me such trouble. I'll let it slide today without saying anything, Urza said. It seemed like she said plenty already. Lucy sweat dropped before turning to Mirajan. Is she like a disciplinary committee or something? That'd be Urza, Happy stated. Well, she has a sharp tongue, but she looks human enough. And I can't really tell much about Kagura. Are they really all that scary? Lucy questioned. Are Natsu and Grey here? Urza questioned. I, Natsu exclaimed, 
both he and Gray wrapping their arms around each other in a buddy-like manner. Hey Urza, the both of us are getting along great today as always. Gray exclaimed. I, Natsu exclaimed. Natsu's acting like happy. Lucy comically exclaimed. I see. Well, even the best of friends fight at times. But I like it most seeing the two of you get along. Urza stated. Um, best friends is a little. Gray mumbled. I, Natsu mumbled. I've never seen Natsu like this. Lucy exclaimed. You're our guild's newest member, right? Kagura questioned. Why yes, Lucy said. Well, Natsu challenged Urza to a fight before and was beat to a pulp. Kagura explained. You mean Natsu? Lucy questioned. And Grey got beat to a pulp when she saw him walking about naked. Macau finished. When Loke courted Urza she beat him to a pulp. Kana added. And then he was stupid enough to try to court Kagura. I beat him to a bloody pulp and threatened to cut off his testicles. Kagura stated casually, a devil-like grin present on her face. He reaped what he sowed, though. Kana stated, oh, so she's like that. Lucy mumbled. Natsu, Gray, I have a favor to ask. Urza said, catching the fire and ice rival's attention. I heard a troubling story after Kagura and I finished this job. Honestly speaking, this is something for Master to decide but I want to settle it quickly so I decided myself. I want the two of you to lend us your power. Will you come with us? Kagura asked. What does this mean? A random guild member questioned. Urza and Kagura asked the two of them for help. Another guild member questioned. This has never happened before, another guild member stated. We're leaving tomorrow morning. Make preparations. Urza stated before walking off carrying the decorated horn under her arm with Kagura following shortly behind her. Make a team, Grey thought, with him, Natsu thought. Urza, Kagura, Natsu, and Grey, I never would have imagined it before. Mirajan mumbled, catching Lucis' attention. But this might be Fairy Tale's ultimate team. Anabu's town, the sun had nearly set in the sky, the storm having reached its peak as lightning and thunder struck the earth, and near the outskirts of this small, friendly town, stood two people. Naruto held his prisoner up off the ground, using the force to choke his victim. Naruto's face was covered in blood, though it was not of his own. I, I swear, that's all I know, that's all I know. The man exclaimed. The man stood at five feet eight inches with black eyes and black hair held up in a short, spiky ponytail. He wore a dirtied white shirt with a high collar and an intricate symbol on its back over a plain, dark red undershirt. He also wore a pair of aquamarine pants, black shoes and small black earrings in each ear. Naruto flexed his left hand, releasing the invisible grip he had over the man. Tsk tsk, Kagiyama, selling out your comrades so quickly. And it only took a little lightning to do so. Naruto stated, wagging his finger in a berating manner at the man, now identified as Kagiyama. I told you everything about the guild's plans. I even gave you the flute. Just please. Let me live, Kagiyama pleaded, Naruto looking on with an expression of indifference. Naruto grabbed Kagiyama by his head with his left hand, his cloak parting slightly to allow one of his knives to levitate out. Kagiyama was about to beg for his life, but was stopped abruptly before he could even form a sentence. The knife Naruto had levitated out had swiftly been stabbed into the back of Kagiyama's neck, into the base of Kagiyama's cerebellum, instantly killing the man. Sorry but no mercy for those who are associated with Zirf. Naruto said to the corpse of Kagiyama, By tomorrow's time, Eisenwald shall be no more. Lightning struck the forest surrounding the town, illuminating Naruto's face and his glowing yellow eyes. The next morning, Magnolia train station. Why'd I have to be stuck with you? Natsu exclaimed. That's my line, Gray exclaimed. If Urza wants help, I can handle that by myself. Then go by yourself. Natsu said, I don't even want to go. Then stay home, and get beaten up by Urza afterwards. Gray retorted, and why do you always walk around with that bedroll? Pretend we don't know them. Lucy muttered, why are you here, Lucy? Happy asked. Because Mira-san said, Lucy started, mini flashback start. Those two are totally going to fight when Urza isn't looking. Mira said in her ever cheerful tone. So please stop them, okay. Me. Lucy questioned, slightly startled. Mini flashback end. You're not stopping them, 
Happy stated. But, Lucy said. I apologize. Were you waiting? Urza called out, causing Natsu and Gray to go immediately into Super Buddies mode. Urza-san, Kagura-san, Lucy exclaimed, only to comically freeze at seeing the two women's luggage. Nice packing, Happy said, right behind Urza and Kagura, being tugged along by the former, was a mountain of luggage. That's a lot of luggage, Lucy comically yelled, let's get along together today, Gray exclaimed. I, sir, Natsu exclaimed, and here comes Happy number two, Lucy deadpanned. Yes. Getting along is the best. And you are, Urza asked, directing her question to Lucy. I remember you, you're the newest guild member. Kagura stated. Yeah, I'm the new recruit, Lucy. Mira-san asked that I come along with you. Thanks for having me. All the while Lucy was talking, Natsu and Grey were butting heads behind Urza and Kagura's back. I am Urza, and this is Kagura. Glad to have you on board, Urza said. Oh, so you're Lucy. You're the one who defeated the guerrilla mercenaries with just one finger, yes. You have my thanks for offering to help. I'll be counting on you. Gee glad to be of service. Lucy muttered, knowing fully well that the truth behind that story was far different from how it was told. Urza, I have one condition for coming along. Natsu said. Hey, Grey exclaimed meekly, knowing that certain doom was impending for the pink-haired dragon slayer mage. What? Tell me. Urza asked, when we get back, fight me, Natsu exclaimed, a fierce look of determination on his face, hey, think it over, Grey exclaimed, you have a death wish, it won't go the same as last time, I'm good enough to beat you now, Natsu stated, causing Urza to smile a bit, it's true that you have improved, I am not confident by any means, however, fine, I'll take you on, Urza stated, all right, I'm all fired up, Natsu exclaimed, Anabu's town. Naruto calmly walked into the town's only magic store, a demonic-looking flute attached to his belt and hidden by his cloak, his hood down, and the blood from Kugayama washed from his face. Normally, Naruto would not be found in any magic shop in any town, but this one was different. They're here, I can sense it, Plagueis whispered in his ear, not bothering to take an ethereal form. Oh, how can I help you, sir? An elderly man called out from behind the counter. Yes, I heard that there was a unique magic item that could be found in this shop. Naruto stated. Unique. Well, that's all a matter of opinion, really. The elderly man stated, pulling out a small dagger. This dagger was used by one of the original ten wizard saints and is infused with lightning make. So it's an over-glorified elemental dagger? Naruto questioned. An over-glorified elemental dagger? This is no ordinary dagger, good sir. For you see, instead of drawing magic from its user, it draws magic from the air around it. The elderly man exclaimed. Hum, I was thinking of something more, exotic. Naruto said, turning around and nearly walking away. But, I guess if you don't have anything else, then I'll just... Wait, the elderly man exclaimed, causing Naruto to stop and smirk before putting on his poker face. If it's exotic you're after, I got something else. He stated, pulling out a medium-sized rectangular box and opening it up, revealing three strange objects. The first item was a slightly curved hilt made of a durable and polished gold bronze-colored metal with a black grip, but no blade. The second object was a chrome and black straight hilt with a small hook near the top and a black grip. And lastly, the third object was a straight hilt with a similar metal to the first hilt but with a more basic look and a slanted top where the blade would be. Oh, what do we have here? Naruto questioned, feigning a look of mild surprise. When I was a young man, I had gone along to an archaeological digging site where I dug up these three things, the elderly man stated, grabbing the first hilt out and examining the object. They don't seem to be powered by any magic I've seen, but I thought they looked pretty cool. Tell ya what, I'll throw in all three of these things with the dagger for. 1,200,000 jewels. Naruto stood silent for a moment before subtly raising his hand up, manipulating the force to influence the man in front of him. You know what, you'll lower the price to 120,000 jewels. Naruto muttered. You know what, I'll lower the price to 120,000 jewels, the man mumbled in a trance-like state. Well, I can't say no to a deal like that, alright, 
you've got a deal, you crafty merchant. Naruto said, placing a month's worth of pickpocketed jewels on the table and grabbing both the dagger and the box before quickly rushing out of the shop, a wicked grin present on his face. Now, time to send Eisenwald a little message from Kagiyama. With Natsu, Grey, Happy, Urza, Kagura, and Lucy. Natsu groaned silently, a nauseous look on his face as the scenery outside the train passed by in a breeze. Natsu, Grey, and Happy all sat on one side of the compartment car, while Lucy, who was holding Plu at the moment, sat beside Kagura and Urza on the opposite side. Man, what a loser! Grey muttered, this is how you get after picking a fight. If it happens every time, though, must be tough on him. Lucy said sympathetically, you poor thing, come, sit next to me, Urza said. I, Natsu said meekly, doing as told, so you're telling me to move. Lucy thought, a comical look of shock on her face. Ah, so you're going to give him that treatment, Kagura said in a matter-of-fact tone. Yes, now then, I'll let you rest, Urza stated. I, Natsu said, only to be jabbed by an iron fist courtesy of Urza and fall over unconscious. Gray noticed this, but pretended not to see. This way it's a bit easier on him. No, she is definitely a bit weird, Lucy thought. Urza, Kagura, isn't it about time you told us? Gray questioned, what are we supposed to be doing? Our opponents are the Dark Guild, Eisenwald. Kagura replied, they intend to do mischief with some magic called, lullaby. Lullaby, Lucy, Gray, and Happy questioned aloud. Then, those guys from before, Lucy muttered, I see, so you also met some members of Eisenwald? Kagura asked, well, they did say something about a lullaby. There's no mistaking it, Gray said. They were refugees from Eisenwald. I suspect they didn't want to follow the plan and were escaping. Kagura stated. So this plan has something to do with lullaby? Gray questioned. I would imagine so. That shadow that snatched them up was probably a member of Eisenwald's main force. Urza said. They had to make a move to keep their plans from leaking. But what could they be planning? Lucy questioned. Eisenwald Guild Hall. Oshibana Town. The Dark Guild, Eisenwald was located in a desolate part of the town that had dead trees and a naturally dark sky. Inside the guild hall, five ex-members of said guild hung from ropes that dangled from the ceiling above with four people walking out of the guild. The first was a tall man with a square-shaped face and dark hair arranged on the front in a flat tuft going upwards, and on his face were three distinctive whisker-like marks. He wore a simple attire consisting of a zipped, brownish jacket with a large collar over a dark shirt, dark pants and simple shoes. The second person was a short, hunched and fat man with no visible nose and very large lips, his face on the whole resembling that of a fish. His hair was green and pointed upwards in many rounded, curved spikes. His attire consisted of a crimson jacket with lighter edges and a high collar, HLED closed right under it but otherwise being left open, over a light shirt, which, being quite short, revealed much of the man's stomach, and loose, plain blackish pants held up by a simple belt and tucked inside boots. He also had a massive necklace around his neck, consisting of several, very large metal discs connected by a rope. The third person was a tanned man with a pointed nose and a sharp chin. He had dark lines circling his eyes, and had donned a distinctive jacket, which was light in the low part and dark in the upper one and on the sleeves, which came equipped with a tight hood covered in black and light stripes. Under this, he wore a light shirt with simple pants and shoes. And lastly, the fourth person was an extremely tall, lean-built, yet mildly muscular man with silver hair held pointing upwards in spiky strands on top of his head, but hung down to the left of his face in a distinctive tuft that reached down to his shoulders. His eyes were dark and he had an elongated face with sharp features and somewhat pointed ears, but seemed to lack eyebrows. His eyes were circled by dark lines and each of them had a simple tattoo right below it, consisting of a pointed ling going vertically, crossed with two more, larger horizontal lines. The upper part of his body was similarly tattooed, but with much larger, intricated and blue-colored motifs, which took on spiraling forms, and adorned his shoulders, biceps, pectorals and back. Seems we got a message from Kagiyama. He finally got that. Item, we've been wanting. The first man stated. Our time has finally come. This is our only chance to accomplish our objective, the fourth man said. 
now, while those old geezer guild masters are having their regular meeting. Still, I can't help but feel as if something's, I don't know, off. The third man speculated. You're too superstitious for your own good, Ryul, the second man said with a small chuckle. Oh bite me, Karaka, the third man, now identified as Ryul, yelled. Guys, calm down, the first man said. Can it, Vyard, Ryul exclaimed. All of you, shut up, the fourth man yelled. But Aragor, the second man, identified as Karaka, complained. No, it's either now or never. There won't be a better opportunity to do this. The fourth man, now identified as Aragor, stated. With Natsu, Grey, Happy, Urza, Kagura, and Lucy. Lullaby, like, a song to get children to sleep. Lucy queried. And the seal he was talking about was thought to be quite a strong spell. Urza stated. So they were also part of Eisenwald. Grey stated. Yes, but I foolishly didn't think of it at the time. Urza said. Or the name Aragor, Kagura added, the top ace of the Dark Guild Eisenwald. Aragor, who's nicknamed, Shinigami, since he only takes assassination requests. Assassinations, Lucy questioned. Naturally assassination requests are banned by the council. But Eisenwald wanted money, and so six years ago they were thrown out of the Mages Guild League. Kagura stated, however, they didn't listen to orders and have continued to operate. Maybe I should go home. Lucy said, both herself and Plu profusely sweating. You're looking juicy all of a sudden. Happy said. It's sweat. Lucy stated, I was in error. Urza said, slamming her fist down onto Natsu's head. If I had noticed the name Aragor back then I would have forced them to suffer and made them tell me their plans. Scary. Lucy exclaimed. I see. Gray said, Eisenwald is planning to do something with this lullaby. And it's definitely something evil, so you want to stop them. Yes, Kagura replied, though the two of us are strong together, we do not feel as if we can oppose an entire guild on our own, and that is why we asked for your help. We're heading straight into Eisenwald. Plu had practically deflated and both Celestial Spirit and Celestial Spirit Mage were sweating even more than before. Sounds interesting, Gray said. I, Happy exclaimed. I wish I hadn't come. Lucy muttered. Lucis Juicy, Happy stated. It's sweat. Lucy exclaimed, with Naruto. In one of the nearby alleyways of Onibus, Naruto held his newly acquired dagger and box in one hand whilst using the force to levitate the three strange metal hilts with the other hand. To think, such lightsabers could be found here of all places. And in such good condition too. Plagueis stated, materializing right beside Naruto as said black-haired man disassembled each lightsaber one by one finding that they each were in pristine condition, but missing one vital part. No focusing crystals, though, Naruto stated, his eyes narrowing at the revelation. Well of course not, it is only logical that they don't. Plagueis said, whoever left these blades here obviously knew what would happen if the natives ever reverse engineered such technology. Then why leave them here in the first place? Naruto questioned. I don't know. Maybe you'll meet whoever left them here in the first place and then you can ask them why. Plagueis said, shrugging his non-existent shoulders. Naruto reassembled the lightsaber hilts and attached them to his belt, tossing the box before examining the dagger. After a few test swings, Naruto flicked his wrist, causing a section of the dagger's hilt to break off and cuff around Naruto's wrist, the entire thing being connected by a thin wire. Raising an eyebrow, Naruto decided to throw the dagger and see what would happen, only for the wire to extend as fast as the blade did, and when it impacted against the stony alley wall, a lightning current sparked forth on contact. Naruto pulled his hand back slightly, causing the dagger to retract back to his hand. Still, it isn't a total loss. A blade like this will prove to be useful for hiding my ability with the force. Naruto stated, flicking his wrist again and causing the wrist attachment to detach and revert back to its hilt form. Now then, Naruto started, pulling up his hood as a wicked grin forming on his face. I have a train to catch. Onibus Town Train Station, are those guys from Eisenwald still here? Gray asked as their little group exited the train. I don't know, but we came here to find out. Kagura replied. Sounds like a wild goose chase to me. Lucy stated. Urza was about to say something, when she accidentally bumped into someone. 
Oof. The two exclaimed as they collided, knocking both parties to the ground. I'm so sorry. Are you all right? Urza questioned. It's all right. No harm. Done. Naruto said, slowing down as he saw who he had bumped into. His hood was still up, thus concealing his surprised reaction. Time seemed to slow down for the black-haired Sith as he stared at the scarlet red hair and brown eyes that the woman had. Urza, he thought before shaking his head slightly. It's fine. I am in a bit of a rush though. Farewell, Naruto said, quickly getting up and walking aboard the train. The entire time, Lucy was frozen in place, shaking in fear. Lucy, what's wrong? Kagura asked, observing Lucy as her eyes that were filled with fear followed Naruto until he boarded the train. It, it can't be, Lucy muttered. What are you talking about? Urza questioned. Gee that man, that man is, Lucy started. Huh, where's Natsu? Happy asked, finally taking notice of their missing group member. It was too late, though, as the train had already left the station. He departed. I was so busy telling the story, I forgot about him. What have I done? And I know he's bad with transportation. This is all my fault. Urza exclaimed. Please, would someone hit me? That's even worse. Lucy exclaimed. What do you mean? Kagura questioned as she flicked Urza on the forehead. When I first met Natsu, he helped save me from Bora of Prominence. Lucy stated. Bora of Prominence, wasn't he found dead a few weeks ago? Kagura questioned. He was. Both Natsu and I were there when that man killed him. Lucy replied. The Black Reaper. The Black Reaper. Grey, Urza, and Kagura exclaimed in shock. And the man that just got on the train that we left Natsu on the guy wearing the black cloak, that's him. That was the Black Reaper, Lucy exclaimed, visibly shaking in fear. With Naruto, Naruto walked around the train, looking for a good place to sit, when suddenly, oh, what do we have here? Naruto said, taking notice of the nauseous form of Natsu. What are the odds that we would meet again? He questioned, getting Natsu to tilt his head up. Naruto moved his hand out in an upward motion, causing Natsu to levitate and his motion sickness to cease. You, Natsu exclaimed, his eyes turning into draconic slits and his hands igniting with flames. Naruto flicked his hands, cancelling the force that levitated Natsu, sending the pink-haired dragon slayer mage down onto the ground, his motion sickness kicking in and causing his flaming fists to be dampened. Now, now, there's no need to resort to violence. Naruto stated, can't we just settle this peacefully? You're a murderer. You killed that fake fairy tale mage. Natsu exclaimed. Though he held no love for those who impersonated members of fairy tale, Natsu still believed that killing the man was too much. I don't need to explain myself to you of all people. In the end, what I am doing will be for the greater good of all. Naruto stated. Before he could do anything else, the train abruptly stopped, causing both Naruto and Natsu to fall backwards. Onabu's town train station. Now look here, you can't just go pulling the emergency lever. One of the conductors said, a sweat drop present on his face as he stared at Urza, who had yet to release her grip on the lever. It's for my ally, and because everyone aboard that train is in great danger, please understand. Urza replied. It's going too far, the conductor exclaimed. And what do you mean by, great danger? We've just only recently discovered a dark mage by the moniker of, the Black Reaper, is on that train. Urza stated, causing the man to freeze up in fear. I'll go and call the Rune Knights. You, mages, can you go pursue him? The conductor asked, getting a nod from Urza. Thank you, I must hurry. You, please bring our luggage to the hotel. Urza said to a nearby man. Why me? The man complained, but was effectively silenced by a glare from Urza. All the people at Fairy Tail are like this, aren't they? Lucy questioned offhandedly. Not me, Gray stated. Then where are your clothes? Lucy comically exclaimed. With Naruto and Natsu, it stopped. Natsu mumbled, his motion sickness wearing off. Naruto got up right before Natsu. Unbeknownst to the Sith, his hood had been pulled down when he got back up, causing Natsu's eyes to widen. And Naruto. Hum. Naruto mumbled, looking at his shoulders to find that his hood was down. Oh well, I guess that means I'll have to convince you not to reveal my true identity, he stated, 
pulling out his newly acquired dagger and rushing at Natsu, lightning flickering around the dagger. That's enough out of you, Natsu exclaimed, punching his fists together and causing them to be lit aflame. I don't know why you're doing these things, Naruto, but I'm going to beat the answers out of you. And with that, Natsu charged forward with flaming fists at Naruto. Said black-haired Sith dodged both fists, causing the train car they were in to explode, creating a gaping hole in the top of the train. My, my, such power behind that punch, Naruto said. High punch, Natsu exclaimed. Uh, that emergency stop appears to have been a false alarm. We will be departing shortly, the train's conductor said over the announcer, ignorant about the events going on at Onibu Station. Crap, I'm out of here, Natsu yelled, grabbing his hiking pack and preparing to jump out of the train, but was stopped by Naruto. Where do you think you're going? I'm not finished with you yet, Naruto stated holding Natsu in midair with the force as the train began moving again. Natsu, Lucy called out, the gang pulling up beside the train in a magic-driven four-wheeler powered by Urza. Taking advantage of the momentary distraction, Natsu shot out a stream of fire at Naruto, who dodged at the last second, effectively breaking his hold on Natsu and singeing his black cloak. With Naruto temporarily downed, Natsu took this as a chance to escape by jumping out of the train, accidentally slamming into Grey and falling to the ground. Urza pulled the magic four-wheeler to a skidding halt to retrieve the duo, effectively allowing the train to escape. Natsu, you okay? Kagura questioned. I, Natsu mumbled. That hurt, jerk, Grey exclaimed, both mages having recovered from the head slam. Shut up, you left me behind, huh? Natsu retorted. That we did, at least you're unhurt, Kagura stated, somehow. What do you mean, unhurt? I got into a fight with a guy me and Lucy met in Harjan town on the train. Natsu stated. You fought the Black Reaper? Grey questioned, somewhat surprised. The Black Reaper? Who the heck's the Black Reaper? Natsu questioned. The guy who was on the train that you fought, was he wearing a black cloak? Urza asked. Oh, you mean Naruto? Natsu said, causing both Urza and Kagura to freeze up. N. Naruto. What was his last name? Kagura finally called out. I don't know. He never told us his last name. Natsu replied. Urza and Kagura stood silent, only getting back into the magic four-wheeler and motioning for the others to enter. He was on that train, right? We'll go after him immediately. Urza exclaimed, pumping magic into the vehicle and causing it to shoot forward after the train. All the while, Urza and Kagura were on the same line of thoughts. Naruto Namikaze, please, don't let it be him, Urza and Kagura thought. Kunugi Station, civilians began screaming as the conductor was dropped to the ground, blood seeping from a slit on his neck, courtesy of Aragor. This train is now the property of Eisenwald, Aragor stated, everyone off, divers and luggage too, resist and you forfeit your lives. Aragor the Shinigami, Naruto called out from inside the train. Kagayama, Aragor questioned turning towards the train. An invisible force sent the man flying backwards and into a nearby building. HMPH, looks like that fool's information was accurate, Naruto said, stepping out of the train with his hood up. Who are you? Where's Kagiyama and Lullaby? Aragor asked as he got up from the rubble he was launched into. From one reaper to another, I guess I'll tell you before you die. Naruto replied pulling out a familiar skull-shaped flute with his left hand. That pawn of yours, Kagiyama, had managed to do the heavy lifting for me by removing the seal on lullaby. He even gave away all your plans before I killed him, he stated as his eyes began glowing and force lightning began cackling around his right hand. Naruto then placed lullaby back in his cloak. As for who I am, I am the Black Reaper. Now, die. With Natsu, Grey, Happy, Urza, Kagura, and Lucy. You're going too fast, Urza. Grey yelled from atop the magic four-wheeler. Even if it's you, don't underestimate the amount of magic it'll drain from you. Urza wasn't listening to her comrade though, her concentration was instead focused on playing out various scenarios in her head involving her confrontation with Naruto. What if it is him? Urza thought. What if it isn't him? Kagura thought. There's only one way to find out. Urza Kagura mentally finished.
This train of thought still didn't stop the sense of dread that both women felt as they came closer and closer to their destination. The magical four-wheeler came to a screeching halt as it pulled into the station. Urza and Kagura swiftly jumped off and onto the ground, taking off into a full sprint with the same destination in mind. Please, don't let it be so, Kagura and Urza thought, rushing past the stationary train. A sharp gasp of shock escaped the two women's lips at what they saw. Blood, the mutilated corpses of the Eisenwald Guild, ranging from decapitation, evisceration, to electrocution. A few were still alive, their limbs having been hacked off or smoke coming off of their recently electrocuted bodies, their faces frozen in terror, shock, or a bit of both. Oh my Kami, Lucy said, the rest of the team having caught up with their resident S-class mages. W. W. Who could have done something like this? Kagura exclaimed, only to let out a shriek of terror when she felt something grab her leg. K. He. L. L. Me. A weak voice called out. The group looked down at the ground, only to find Ryul. Rather, what was left of him? The man was missing both his legs from just above where his knees would have been, his left arm appeared to have been chopped off at the shoulder, a deep, long gash went diagonally from his right shoulder blade down to his left hip, and he had a small amount of smoke coming off of his body, signifying he had been electrocuted. Who did this? Urza asked. A. M. Monster. Ryul replied, using his remaining arm to point to the south. E. Rigor. Sama. Is still. Fi. Fi. Fighting. That. Thing. As he continued to speak, his voice became softer and softer until it was no more than a whisper. Damn it. We're losing him. Stay with me. You're going to live. You're going to live. Urza exclaimed, tightly gripping the man. Urza. Natsu called out. You won't die. Urza yelled. Urza. Natsu repeated, you're going to make it through this, Urza exclaimed, Urza, Natsu yelled, finally catching the red-haired woman's attention, he's dead, Urza's eyes widened in shock, though deep down inside she already knew what the dragon slayer had stated, hesitantly, her gaze fell down to find the unblinking dull eyes of Ryul, a last shallow breath leaving the man as he died, E Urza, we have to keep moving, Kagura called out, shaking the red-haired woman out of her stupor. He said that Aragor was still fighting, whoever did this. Quote dot dot dot, right, Urza mumbled, standing up shakily with her eyes overshadowed by her hair. Let's go, she exclaimed, putting on a brave face as she charged forward, the others following suit shortly behind her. As the sounds of fighting grew louder and louder, so did the sinking feeling both Urza and Kagura felt as they came closer. With Naruto, Magic Wind Palm, the panicked cry of Aragor as he launched a highly destructive tornado from his palms was all the indication Naruto needed to know. Aragor the Shinigami was on his last legs, the entirety of his fellow guild members either killed or maimed, his signature scythe embedded in the earth below him, and his executioner standing beneath him. The black-haired assailant quickly channeled the force around him in self-telekinesis, throwing himself out of harm's way a mere seconds before the ground he once stood on was churned up by the wind attack. Acting fast, Naruto focused on engulfing Aragor with the near-invisible energy that he commanded and motioned downward with his hand, causing the self-proclaimed Shinigami to fall down to the earth in correlation to the black-haired man's motions. Like a sadistic composer, Naruto moved his hand up and down three more times, each time his hands thrust upward pulled Aragor up as well and each thrust downward sending the man back into the ground. Finally, Naruto released his telekinetic grip on Aragor, causing the man to release a groan of pain. His brief lapse of relief vanished just as quickly as it appeared when Naruto began to walk towards the fallen man, using the force halfway to pull his hood back up, which had fallen off sometime during their altercation. Uh, P please, I, Ak, Aragor pleaded, only for a chalking feeling to hit him. Naruto's hand slowly raised up in a bald fist-like motion, which in turn caused Aragor to levitate up as well, all the while gripping at his throat as he tried to take in the necessary air to live. You know, Naruto called out, casually speaking to the dying man as if they were walking in a park. When I first heard of the resurfacing of one of Zeref's artifacts, I thought to myself, who in the world would be so stupid? Apparently you, it seems, he continued speaking floating up so that he was at eye level with Aragor. Nevertheless, 
I'd like to thank you for making my job that much simpler. For if not for your stupidity, I would have a much more difficult time tracking down these things. As the light began to leave Aragor's eyes, the only thing the man could focus on was the golden yellow eyes of his soon to be killer. Stop right there. The feminine cry broke Naruto of his monologue, his cloaked head quickly snapping in the direction the voice came from. His eyes widened in shock and surprise at who he saw, his right eye, unbeknownst to himself, flickering back and forth between royal purple and golden yellow. E. Urza, K. Kagura, Naruto mumbled silently to himself, momentarily allowing his grip around Aragor to be released, causing the silver-haired man to slump to the ground, far too deprived of oxygen to be considered among the living anymore. T. That's, the Black Reaper, Lucy exclaimed, shaking in fear at the sight of the notorious criminal. Quote dot 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 quote. Naruto said nothing, his hand retracting back into his cloak as he gazed upon the group of fairy tale mages. N Naruto, Naruto Namikaze, Urza called out hesitantly, fearful of what answer she would receive. Quote dot 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 quote. Naruto continued to remain silent, gently floating back to the ground, his gaze still trained on the fairy tale group, specifically his childhood friends. Naruto, is that you? Kagura asked, feeling the need to reiterate Urza's question once more. Gur, I can't take the suspense. Fire Dragon's iron fist, Natsu yelled, charging forward as his fist lit a flame. Urza Chan, Kagura Chan, Naruto called out, using the force to quickly throw the pink haired dragon slayer off course and into the ground below him. You, you two have certainly grown since we last met. His statement was vague and cryptic to the other members of the group, but to Urza and Kagura, it was all the confirmation they needed to hear. Tears began to freely fall from Urza's eyes, while Kagura had gone into a state of shock. We've all grown since then, nay, none of us were the same as we were back then, he stated, slowly walking towards the two petrified women. Ice make. Arrows. Gray exclaimed crafting a bow and arrows from ice and firing the latter at high speed towards Naruto, only to bounce harmlessly off the invisible shield that surrounded the latter. Naruto, Urza mumbled, you bastard, you made Urza and Kagura cry, Natsu exclaimed, charging forward once more at the hooded man, his fists igniting in the process. I don't know whether or not you're Naruto, or a different person entirely. But what I do know is that you, he yelled as he slammed his fist against the invisible barrier. Are, another fist was thrown by Natsu, a monster. Something inside Naruto snapped and the force reacted to his emotions, causing him to fire off a force shockwave, spreading far enough to knock Natsu, Grey, Lucy, Urza, and Kagura off their feet. What I do, what I will do, is for the greater good of everyone. Naruto stated coldly, walking over to a terrified Natsu, the pinket stumbling backwards in an unsuccessful attempt to escape the hooded man's wrath. So call me what you will, but know this. You may judge me by my actions, but I am not a monster. I'm something far worse. He finished, picking Natsu up with his hand gripped tightly around his throat. I will end that man, the one who started this all, and no man, woman, child, or demon will stop me. Fire dragons, iron fist, Natsu hoarsely yelled, slamming a flaming fist into Naruto's stomach. Ag, Naruto cried out in pain screaming as the fire began to spread from his shirt. Acting fast, Naruto pulled out his dagger and hacked his flaming shirt off. Ice make. Arrows. Naruto barely moved out of the way in time to dodge the ice projectiles. Fire dragons. Gun magic. Spark shot. Wa. Natsu barely spoke before an electrifying bullet struck his neck, causing him to drop to the ground temporarily paralyzed. Natsu-kun. Lucy exclaimed. What are you orders, sir? Open fire. Stun only. We don't need any more of an incident in fury than we've already created. Yes sir. And with that, four more well-placed electric shots were fired, knocking the remaining fairy tale mages to the ground, their bodies numb. The Black Reaper. Known for his brutal, methods in dealing with dark and light mages alike. Dot dot quote. Naruto turned around to find several people in front of him six of whom were all in the same uniform and the seventh most likely being their commanding officer, a man with slicked back gray hair that stood at 5 feet 9 inches and wore a gray-green double-breasted dress tunic and trousers, a black leather belt with silver buckle, 
black leather steel cap boots, black leather gloves, and an officer's cap. Gripped in his hand was a smoking long-barreled desert eagle with an ACOG scope. What caught the temporarily paralyzed mages and dark mage, however, was the tri-wing shuttle-like aircraft with a central stationary wing flanked by a pair of folded wings. Who are you? Naruto questioned, yellow eyes glowing menacingly as his hands cackled with force lightning. Your presence has been requested by King Daijuni Maximus Caesar of the Pergrand Kingdom, the man stated, extending his free hand to the dark, mage. It is advisable that you comply with us. N. Naru. 2. Urza weakly called out, gripping Naruto's cloak like her life depended on it. The black-haired man simply unhinged the hook holding his cloak together, allowing the dark cloth to flutter down to the ground, covering the red-haired woman as she cried. Lead the way. Unknown location, the Inquisitor, one of our finest transport airships, the officer stated. Twenty meters in length, it is outfitted to be light and fast, yet still armed with enough weapons to be considered a combat vessel. Quote dot 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 quote. Naruto remained silent, leaning against the nearby wall with an uncaring expression. So, permission to speak freely sir. Permission granted, private. Well, um, sir. This, Black Reaper. He scares me. He hasn't said a word since stepping aboard the Inquisitor. Quote dot 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 quote. See, it's like he's not even trying to intimidate me. Shut up. He can hear you. Quote dot dot dot. Why won't you say anything? Quote dot dot dot. Shut up before I kill you. Naruto finally said, glaring menacingly at the soldier. S sorry sir. Dot dot dot. You imbecile. The voice of his former master via forced telepathy caught Naruto off guard. Plagueis, Naruto mentally called out, check your belt. Naruto's eyes widened as he felt the objects attached to his belt, finding his dagger and, a lone lightsaber hilt. With Team Natsu, what I do, what I will do, is for the greater good of everyone. I am not a monster. I'm something far worse. Wake, child. Urza's eyes snapped open a voice that was shrouded in mystery and wisdom catching her off guard. So, tired, Urza thought, lightly gripping the black fabric still draped over her face. Stand, child, listen to my voice. Who, who are you? Single quote dot dot dot. I am a remnant from the past. Nothing more, nothing less. Then why should I listen to you? That is for another time. Now stand. Through sheer willpower, the red-haired woman moved her arms and pushed off the ground, still clutching the cloak in her hand. Urza, Kagura called out. Urza glanced towards the woman, finding her childhood friend had regained her movement somewhat and stood up, the others were still paralyzed however. Clank clang, the sound of metal colliding against the ground caught the two women's attention. Sword, hilts, Dorado City, Per Grand Kingdom. Ah, Dorado City, jewel of the Per Grand Kingdom, is it not? The officer questioned, that was a rhetorical question, by the way, we've arrived at our destination. Private Jones. Sir, for the millionth time, it's pronounced Jones. What, really, shut up Jones, seriously, lots of people have the name, it's very common. How am I the first guy you've met called Jones? Just bring the Black Reaper to his majesty. Sigh yes sir. Dorado City Palace. Naruto craned his head upward to fully take in the grandeur view of the building. The walls had a glow to them in the sunlight, as if they were made of gold, and much of the light in the room was provided by the massive stained glass dome above depicting five strange symbols, four of which he assumed were of the kingdom's departments, and the fifth being the royal crest. He'd be lying to himself if he said he wasn't a little bit impressed at the display of power. Private Jones quickly led the black-haired dark mage down a set of corridors, ending up in front of a large gilded door with four guards present. This is as far as I may go, the guards will lead you on from here. Jones stated, quickly running off and leaving Naruto alone with the guards. The Black Reaper, one of the guards called out. Yes, that is me. Naruto replied, causing another one of the guards to scoff. Ya don't look like much to me, ak. The guard's arrogance was rewarded with Naruto making a bald fist, using the force choke to lift the man off his feet, his feet lifted off the ground and his hands clawing at his own throat in an attempt to escape the stranglehold that deprived him of air. I find your lack of faith, disturbing. Naruto simply said, 
releasing his hand and allowing the man to drop down on his knees to the ground, coughing and breathing heavily as he practically groveled at the dark mage's feet. You, uh, are right this way, s sir, a third guard stated, motioning to the first and fourth guards, said men quickly opening the doors. Naruto donned a stoic expression before walking behind the third guard as he lead the black-haired man onward. Play Star Wars Episode 5 Soundtrack, Imperial Starfleet Deployed, City in the Clouds. Ah, the, Black Reaper, so pleasant of you to finally join us. An excited voice called out. Glancing around the room, Naruto saw that everything, compared to what he saw along the way, was more simplistic. A few long tables, trophies weapons and identical banners on the wall, matching carpets, and two large thrones. On one throne was a middle-aged man with graying hairs, a Van Dyke beard, and emerald green eyes. An elegant red silk cape with white frills was draped over his shoulders, and he wore an intricate purple-blue robe underneath and a crown of gold encrusted with jewels of all sorts. On the throne next to him was a beautiful young woman with scarlet red hair, ruby red eyes, a plump rear and a large perky buxom, and a sultry smirk plastered on her face. She wore a simple silk crimson red and black low-cut dress with black frills at the shoulders and wrists and a slit at the top of her right thigh, allowing a great deal of her alabaster legs to be seen with one leg crossed over the other. Lastly, a small crown decorated with rubies was atop her head. The pleasure is all mine, Naruto said, bowing slightly to the duo. Oh, the pleasure will be all yours. What was that, dear? I said that we should move this meeting along. After all, would it not be uncouth of us to keep him waiting when we were the ones to request his presence? Ah yes, the man exclaimed, I am King Dijuni Maximus Caesar of the Pergrand Kingdom, and this is my wife, Queen Lilith Maximus Caesar. Might you tell us your name? I go by many names, Dijuni San. Naruto stated, right, of course, he he he, Dijuni awkwardly laughed, causing Lilith to sigh and rub her temples. Get on with it, darling. Lilith said, a hint of annoyance in her voice as she spoke. Um, well you see, we've done our best to keep the Pergrand Kingdom isolated from the rest of Earthland after the last great war, but now we have a more, pressing problem. Daijuni stated. Go on, Naruto replied, our kingdom shares its border with Alakatasia, specifically the Alvarez Empire. Those mongrels are getting restless, as well as our civilians. Daijuni explained. You mean a revolt? Naruto stated, yes, that is the reason why you're here. Lilith stated, the Alvarez Empire has begun to support the rebels, providing weapons, soldiers, all sorts of assets. They're preparing for war, Naruto finished, causing Lilith to shake her head. No, war has already been declared, but we've done our best to conceal all news about it from spreading across Earthland. Lilith corrected, we wish to hire your, services. Daijuni replied, even if your actions have been limited to just fury, your name is infamous enough to reach even the ears of the Alvarez Empire, strike fear into all who have heard of your exploits. I'm a dark mage, wouldn't that be dangerous for your reputation? Naruto questioned. We care not for that, only that this rebellion is put down. Lilith retorted, a hidden lust in her eyes that went unnoticed by her husband, even as she licked her lips and shifted around so that she was leaning downward flaunting her ample DD cup borderline E cup breasts to Naruto. So, name your price. Hum, what kind of perks would come with this job? After all, I care little for monetary gain. Naruto asked. You would be provided your own battalion, given the rank of captain, and anything else you so desire. Daijuni replied. Anything, Naruto queried, a dark grin spreading across his face. Anything, Lilith replied her grin matching Naruto's own. This is a generous offer, so who am I to refuse? Naruto stated. Glad you see things our way, Black Reaper San. Please, call me Darth Revan. Urza silently stared at the sword hilt in her hand, her other arm acting as a makeshift platform to rest her chin upon. She was uncertain if Naruto had purposefully left two sword hilts when he left or if it was accidental, but she couldn't figure out how they worked. Urza gave the slightly curved sword hilt to Kagura, on the off chance that she would have any more luck figuring the partial weapon out. Four months had passed since their encounter with Naruto, and, the Black Reaper, had pretty much vanished off the face of Earthland. Their rival guild, 
Phantom Lord, had attacked them two months back, unsuccessfully, but other than that, nothing else had happened besides the guild hall being demolished. Urza Chan, the red-haired woman tilted her head to the side slight to find the guild master, Makarov Dreyar. The man was extremely short, standing at three feet zero inches and in his late eighties. He had black eyes and was growing bald with only the outer rims of his head containing white hair. He also had a thick white mustache, and his fairy tale guild mark was in black and hidden underneath his clothing, which consisted of a white tunic with the fairy tale symbol on the left collar, and black pants, all in which was covered by a formal white coat with white fur around the edges and with the ten wizard saints symbol on the back. Master, what is it? Urza asked half heartedly, causing Makarov to look at the woman with sadness. He knew about Urza and Kagura's confrontation with their childhood friend. Hell, every mage in Fury knew about their confrontation with the Black Reaper, not by the fact that the three knew each other, but because these fairy tale mages were the only people to ever encounter the Black Reaper and live. The, there's some people here asking to see you, Kagura Chan, Natsu Chan, Grey Chan, and Lucy Chan. They say it's urgent, Makarov replied only for the red-haired mage to turn back and continue staring at the sword hilt. Go with him, child. The force guides you too. And there was that voice again. It kept telling her about this strange concept called, the force, telling her tales about warriors known as, Jedi, fighting to maintain peace. They say that it has something to do with, the Black Reaper. Urza perked up at the mention of the infamous Dark Mage. What? Where is he? Urza questioned. Come with me to my office, Makarov said. Be calm, child, remember the Jedi Code. Emotion, yet peace. Ignorance, yet knowledge. Passion, yet serenity. Chaos, yet harmony. Death, yet the Force. Right, Varen Sensei, not all our caverns, her grand kingdom. Drip drip. The sound of water dripping was ignored by Naruto, the black-haired man focused more on the objects in front of him. I'm disappointed that it took you this long to find one, Revan. Not to mention the fact that you lost two of the hilts fighting against those mediocre fairy tale mages. Plagueis's form materialized beside his former apprentice, arms crossed and irritation present in his gaze. The fact that you've suffered technical defeats at the hands of these, savages has made me question why I ever chose you as my apprentice. Those savages were my childhood friends, Naruto mentally started. Have I taught you nothing, boy? Have all these years been for naught? Plagueis questioned, causing Naruto's eyes to narrow in anger, his eyes glowing menacingly in the dark. I have more important things to attend to rather than another one of your lectures. Naruto mentally retorted, turning back to the two objects in front of him. He couldn't help but grin at the sight, his Jinsu Razor lightsaber hilt floating with the help of the Force. The only reason why he could see the weapon hilt was because of the metallic glint it gave off from the reflection of light the second object gave off, a glowing red crystal that emitted a small amount of heat. The dark mage knelt down and began to meditate, causing the Jinsu razor to disassemble. A lightsaber is an extension of your being, a weapon that you will use to carry out your will. Plagueis explained as the lightsaber hilt was slowly reassembled, only with the red crystal embedded in the center. Peace is a lie there is only passion. Through passion, we gain strength. Through strength, we gain power. Through power, we gain victory. Through victory, our chains are broken. The force shall free us. By the time Plagueis finished speaking, Naruto finished reassembling his blade, the hilt dropping into his lap. Asterisk Fzip, the lightsaber ignited, glowing with a red plasma blade and humming as it made contact with the air. Lord Revan, Naruto quickly deactivated his lightsaber, turning towards the cave's exit to find one of his soldiers standing nearby. Speak, Naruto said, Sir, orders have come in from the capital, the soldier stated. Rebel leaders have been spotted near the Pergrand Kingdom's western borders. Anything else? You uh, yes, sir. They also say that the armor you've requested has arrived. Excellent, Naruto muttered standing up and staring at the soldier, the latter flinching under the golden-eyed gaze. Tell the captains to rally the troops. We will be moving in 0600 hours. Fairy Tale Guildhall, Magnolia Town, Fury. Now that you're all gathered here, I'd like to introduce you to, um. Makarov started, 
coming to the stark realization that he never got the names of the three people that requested Team Natsu. My name is Reginald, but most people call me Agent Wyoming, a tall man stated. Out of the three new people, Wyoming was the tallest, standing at 5 feet 11 inches with gray eyes, black hair and a mustache. He wore a black form-fitting suit with white lines, on top of which he wore white armor plating on his shoulders, forearms, legs, and chest. You can call me 479er. The second person was an abrasive woman that stood at 5 feet 4 inches wearing silver steel trimmed light armor, with her face concealed underneath the pilot's helmet. Agent Washington. The third and final person was a man with dark gray hair and gray eyes, standing at 5 feet 7 inches. He wore the same outfit as Wyoming, only his had gray and yellow armor plating. Are you five, six? Happy counts too, I, quote dot dot dot, six, the ones who encountered, the Black Reaper, and lived. Washington, are you, yeah, that bastard kept using some invisible power to throw us around. I, Natsu exclaimed, happy following up with his ever so cheerful tone. Yes, we were, I don't see why we wish to hire you for a mission. A long-term mission, Washington stated, cutting off Urza's statement. E.H. If you wanted to hire fairy tale mages, why didn't you just post a quest through the, uh, conventional method? Makarov questioned. Because we don't want to hire fairy tale mages, we want to hire mages that have faced off against him. Washington said bluntly. I do apologize for my colleague's behavior. But the matter of the fact is, we need your assistance. Wyoming stated, so please, name your price. Discuss payment later, we've come a long way to find you people and time is off the essence. 479er added, where exactly did you three come from? Kagura asked, the per grand kingdom, everyone, sans 479er, Washington, and Wyoming froze up at the answer. Despite being the largest nation on the peninsula Ishgar, there was no news coming out of its borders. Nothing at all as if the entire country just went silent overnight. The per grand kingdom, E.H. How do we know you're telling the truth? Makarov queried. Set long est Suleiman parle koramant par les indigenes, non. This language is only fluently spoken by the natives, no. 479er questioned, confusing most of the fairy tale mages. Ceci est un long essentielment morts, this is a mostly dead language, I haven't heard that dialect in over 30 years. Makarov stated, though his speech in their language was slower and less fluent. I guess you really are from the Per Grand Kingdom. Tell me, what's happening over there? You mean you don't know? 479er said, of course they don't. Remember the border patrols, Washington retorted. Border patrols, Urza called out. The country is divided against itself. There's a civil war going on. There are the Per Grand Loyalists, mostly composed of the upper class and their lackeys, and there is us, the new republic, composed of the working class, those who were oppressed by the government. Washington stated, and over the past four months, there have been reported sightings of, the Black Reaper, aka Darth Revan. He was last seen about a week ago, leading a battalion of per grand loyalists towards the Nautilar caverns. With Naruto, troops, fall in, Naruto barked, yes sir. The collective cries of the soldiers under his command was near deafening. Despite Daijuni's claim of this battalion being small, it still consisted of four companies, each divided into ten platoons consisting of two squads of ten soldiers. All in all, that was 800 soldiers under his command. Company cuz please step forward. Naruto commanded, causing four people to step forward. Introduce yourselves, left to right. Sure thing, Lord Revan. I'm Major John Ark, but everyone calls me Felix. The first was a tall man, standing at six feet one inch with cold and calculating dark blue eyes that held a hint of mischief and arrogance, slightly toned skin, and messy blonde hair. He wore orange and gray Venator class scout armor with a military grade knife sheathed on the top of his chestplate, an M395 designated anti mage marksman rifle, DMR for short, in his hands, and a gun magic revolver was holstered at his side. Short, sweet, rolls off the tongue, ladies love it. Just like cancer. Oh shut up, blondie. You're blonde too, you idiot. Ahem, right, getting off track. Felix mumbled, I work with Shadow Squad, mostly. Our job is assault, 
stealth and sabotage. I can't use magic, but I am still fucking awesome. Very well, next, Naruto said, yes sir, I am Captain Ino Yamanaka, sir. The second company leader was a young woman that stood at 5 feet 5 inches with platinum blonde hair, her bangs having a natural lift while still covering the right side of her face, while the rest of her hair hung loosely, reaching her calves, a slim, yet womanly figure, pale skin, and light green cupulous eyes. She wore no armor whatsoever, her outfit consisting of a short purple, sleeveless midriff blouse, elbows fishnets, a purple miniskirt that barely reached the beginning of her thighs, fishnet shorts, and black ninja sandals carrying a standard-issue sniper rifle in her hands. I'm in charge of Rakan Squad, which, as the name suggests, is in charge of reconnaissance. I'm the best sharpshooter in the Pergrand Kingdom and I can use mind magic. Next, I am Captain Pira Nikos of Jupiter Squad. We are tasked with frontline assaults. I'm a master of polarity magic, and can utilize spears, daggers, and swords effectively. The third person that Naruto laid eyes on was a beautiful woman 6 feet 0 inches in stature with vivid green eyes, a pale white complexion, red hair held in a waist-length ponytail, curled slightly into a loose ringlet. She wore Mark VI class armor in a cyan coloration with silver trimmings and had a DMR holstered on her back. Hey Pira, no, Felix, but you haven't even heard what I was going to say. Felix complained, causing Pira to sigh and rub her temples. Do explain, Captain Nikos. Naruto said, well, this lovely red beauty has refused the dashing and handsome, Felix started. He keeps asking me out and attempting to flirt with me, it's quite annoying. Pira stated in annoyance, you know, I think I might have considered your request if you weren't a womanizer. Ah, but you aren't like those other women, Felix retorted, feigning a yawn and attempting to wrap an arm around Pira only for said red-haired woman to push his arm away. One day, Pira Chan. In your dreams. Next. Hi, I'm Dr. Emily Gray, chief of the medical division and T&I squad. The fourth and final person was a woman that stood at 5 feet 6 inches with light olive skin, long black hair with purple highlights held in a ponytail, and black eyes. Compared to the three before her, she wore the most civilian-esque clothing, a purple shirt, a white scarf, rectangular glasses, a black knee-length skirt, and a white lab coat with splatters of blood covering it. Quote dot dot dot, you're kidding, Naruto deadpanned, no silly, I'm Dr. Gray, Emily stated, haha, bad joke, I can also use healing magic and a bit of shadow magic. Quote dot dot dot, is she really, yes, and there's a reason why she's head of torture and interrogation, Eno stated, shivering at the very thought, I see. Naruto mumbled, everyone, listen up, today is your first day as a member of this battalion. In a few hours, we will begin our first mission, nothing like the simulation missions you did in basic training. Rebel leaders have been spotted near the western borders. He stated, I won't lie to you, this mission will not be easy, some of you may die. But those who survive will emerge battle-hardened and prepared for whatever the war will throw at us. It is time to show these rebels our power to preserve our way of life. We are THE 501st Battalion. The resounding battle cry was all the Dark Mage needed to hear to know that his morale boost had worked. They believed in him. And for a brief moment, he believed in himself as well. With Team Natsu, is that it? Yep, that's our ship. It's a, uh, where are the sails? Baka, it's not that kind of ship. She's an airship, the D-77TC Pelican. But, it doesn't look that aerodynamic. Lucy stated, Urza and Kagura were on board with the quest from the very first mention of Naruto, Natsu and Grey soon caving into the former's, persuasion, and finally the busty blonde celestial spirit mage was just dragged along without consent. The three per grand citizens quickly discussed it over with Master Makarov and labeled this mission as a 10-year quest, something the trio insisted on ranking, leading them to where they are now. Standing in front of their Transportation, to the Pergrand Kingdom. 100 feet 9 inches in length with a wingspan of 82 feet 4 inches, it had a one chin mounted auto cannon, two missile pods, and two main engines housed in the middle section of the ship, 10 housed in four vector pylons. She's not meant to look pretty, she's meant to be faster and tougher than she looks. 479er stated, tapping her hand against the metal hull. 
She can get us from Fury to the Pergrand Kingdom in six or seven hours. We'll give you all two hours to pack and say your goodbyes. You guys won't be coming back for a while, Washington said, and guys, welcome to the New Republic. Boom. The D-77TC Pelican shook as an explosion went off right beside it. Pira glanced over to her commanding officer, trying to discern what was going through his mind. Gone was Naruto's old attire, and in its place he wore a dark grey robe, pants and a sash of the same coloration, and black steel-toed boots. On top of all this, he donned an open black cloak and opera-length black gloves wrapped in studded red-brown leather straps. His hood was up, concealing his face from view to the soldiers around him. Lord Revan. The crew chief came out from the cockpit and called out to the hooded Sith. Naruto turned his head to look at the man, nearly causing him to flinch from his very gaze. W we will be arriving at landing site Alpha in T-2 minutes. First and fourth company have already touched down and have begun to engage the new republic, second company has just made it to landing site Bravo and are setting up as we speak. Excellent, Naruto said, have second company provide take out any new republic soldiers they can pick off. Any non-medical personnel in fourth company will provide suppressing fire. I want first company to cripple any structures or means of escape for our enemies. And Captain Nikos. Yes my lord, Pira questioned. I will be accompanying you and third company on the front lines. Naruto stated, we will be taking the main stronghold. Understood, Pira curtly replied, and sir, I. Incoming, boom, the pelican shook more violently than before, alarms blaring as the ship jerked to the right. Everyone, brace for Impa, crash, with team Natsu. The five fairy tale mages, six when counting happy, all sat in silence with Washington both 479er and Wyoming piloting the ship. Are you sure, sir? I? Yes, yes, none, sir. Very well. The cockpit door opened up, allowing Wyoming to enter the internal bay. Ahem ladies and gentlemen, there's been a change in plans. Huh, Lucy questioned, we'll be heading to Ponant Peak to join up with our forces. The loyalists have begun their assault ahead of schedule, Wyoming stated. Ahead of schedule? How would you know that? Gray questioned. We have our ways, Washington replied, so prepare yourselves now while you can, because we'll be heading straight into the battle. Well, that went to hell quicker than we thought. 479er called out, out of the frying pan into the shit. With Naruto and Pira, cough cough my lord, Pira exclaimed, finding the cloaked man absolutely still with his head bowed down. Fearing the worst, she averted her eyes to inspect the rest of her soldiers, only to come face to face with a sharpened chunk of fallen debris, most likely from the pelican roof if the gaping hole above her was anything to go by. Move, now, Naruto's voice caught the red-haired soldier by surprise, more shocked that he was still alive than because of the metal poised right in front of her. His words finally caught up with her, and she shifted over to the right and out of harm's way. Naruto released a sigh the metal debris impaling the wall next to Pira not even a second later. Thanks, Pira mumbled, what are your order now, my lord? Get any who are still alive out of the wreckage, I'll do what I can to secure a perimeter. Naruto stated before he stood up and exited the crashed pelican. There it is, secure the crashed pelican. Dozens upon dozens of soldiers began to surround the burning wreckage, the cloaked Sith mentally noting that they had crashed on top of one of the more flat areas of the mountain range. Sir, we have one survivor identified outside of the pelican. Naruto's eyes snapped up as a lone soldier's voice caught his attention. The New Republic Alliance starboard symbol was emblazoned in red on each of their right shoulders, a symbol that Naruto quickly identified as the enemy's. Attention cloaked person, put your hands in the air or we will shoot. Quote dot 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 quote. Naruto remained silent, flicking his right wrist and causing his Jinsu razor to shoot out into his hand. Whoa, what's that in his hand? Asterisk zoom. The crimson plasma hissed as it made contact with the air, a pair of golden yellow eyes glowing underneath Naruto's hood. Dorito City Palace. Meanwhile, with the king and queen of the Pergrand Kingdom, the former was chatting with twelve of the nobles from his court and the latter was resting her head on her arm, completely uninterested in the conversation Daijuni was having. Occasionally, some of the nobles would sneak lecherous glances at her body, but she was quite used to that. 
They couldn't go any further than that without risking their king's wrath. Darling, Lilith called out, leave us, Daijuni stated, waving his hand to dismiss the others in the room. Each nobleman bowed to the duo before making their way out the exit, the large ornate doors closing as the last noble left. Ah, finally, Lilith sighed, stretching the kinks out of her body. You truly do know how to make a conversation long-winded, Daijuni. I apologize, Mistress Sama, Daijuni said, his once cheery expression being replaced by robotic replies and an emotionless mask. I remind you, Daijuni, I hate it when people test my patience. Lilith retorted. Yes Mistress Sama, send out a summons for the scientist, I wish to be updated on the progress of TC-115. Yes Mistress Sama, and summon Darth Revan to my chambers as soon as the assault at Ponant Peak is resolved. I wish to, study him further. Quote dot dot dot, yes, Mistress Sama, Daijuni replied, hesitating for a second, his eyes narrowing slightly as he made his way towards the door to comply with his Mistress Sama's commands. Dot dot dot, he still shows signs of resisting submission. I had hoped that would have been squashed when I marked him as my slave. But that boy, Darth Revan, I sense the power of the dark side in him. I know, master, I sensed it as well. And what exactly do you plan to do with him? What do you think? That doesn't answer my question, acolyte. Quote dot dot dot, you'll see, with Naruto and Pira, asterisk shwsht worked zoom. Pira watched in morbid fascination as Naruto hacked and slashed his way through the enemy ranks. And she called it morbid fascination because his movements were so fluent. She grew up in a more militaristic family, so she wasn't as affected as her soldiers were at the site. To them, her soldiers, they saw Naruto's actions for what they were, a man who was killing without remorse. But what Pira saw was an elegant dance. Just like how her great-grandfather explained fighting. Asterisk SHHNK. Naruto's lightsaber deactivated, the crimson blade vanishing in less than a second. Captain Nikos. Naruto called out, breaking the red haired soldier out of her stupor. Yes, sir. The end. Thanks for watching. Also remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.